Greetings, greetings. Welcome, everyone. On behalf of the Department of Africanology and African American Studies at Temple University in Philadelphia, we welcome you to the 19th Annual Underground Railroad and Black History Conference. It is important to note that this is the only conference of its kind. And we have to emphasize that by saying it's the only academic annual conference. It'll be 20 years in 2023, consecutively held conference at a major university across the nation focusing on the Underground Railroad history and research. And at this time, I would like to defer to the co-founder of this wonderful conference, Dr. Anthony Waski, who's going to share some words, and then I will move on to introduce Dr. Nilgun Okor. So, Dr. Waski, the floor is yours, and welcome, and welcome everyone else. I think you're muted, Dr. Waski. Andy. I always say it's not a true Zoom until somebody is muted and speaking. <laughs> it was me yesterday, so okay. there you go. I'm never going to get used to this. Um, I was saying that I'm, I'm very flattered and very humbled and, um, and wonderfully uh, pleased and, and privileged to have uh, been associated with this wonderful enterprise since 2003. I, I retired from Temple after 20 years in 2019. I'm still active uh, in retirement, but nevertheless, I, I have a special place in my heart for uh, the Civil War and Emancipation Studies. We, we used to call this quest, Civil War and Emancipation Studies at Temple. Uh, and uh, our themes have been just the gamut of 19th century um, Black history and going into um, slavery, emancipation, uh, the Civil War, uh, the African American colors, as they call them, colored troops, uh, and their tremendous contributions uh, during the Civil War, uh, helping to free themselves, to free their own race, and then uh, post-war reconstruction, and then the um, the the uh, search for equal rights, uh, as exemplified by the great Philadelphia hero uh, Octavius Caddo. We devoted uh, several. Uh, conferences to that theme and the role of Philadelphia, which was immense in um, in the emancipation process. So uh, I'm here. I, I I can't claim to have done too much uh, preparation for this. My colleague Nilgon Okor, who's coming on, is is responsible for most of this work. I've helped as best I could, uh, but I wish all of you success and thanks very very much. And I'm here. And I'm anxious to hear what's going to be said. Thank you. Thank you. And in my research, I was definitely appreciative of your passion, Dr. Waski. And most importantly, when I saw that you were active with some of the young people, I saw you in, in character and really trying to bring this history to life. And I always appreciate the passion of the instructors, not just at Temple University, but around the world to really feel like there's a mission, you know, beyond just our capacity, you know, in terms of our professional uh, work, we go outside in the community and really try to inspire and transform lives. So I, I thank you for that and for your work with this conference. At this time, I'm gonna be reading just a portion of the bio for Dr. Neil Gunakor, um, my senior colleague, the presidential professor of Africology at Temple University College of Liberal Arts holds an interdisciplinary PhD in Africology, American Studies, Black Literature, Women's Writing, Comparative and Interdisciplinary Discourses. She is the chair of faculty, the Faculty Senate Status of Women, and she serves on that committee in that capacity. She serves as an affiliated faculty at Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies. And she is the co-founder of the Underground Railroad and Black History Conference at Temple University since 2004. In her book titled Dismantling Slavery, Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, and the Formation of the Abolitionist Discourse, 1841 to 1851, she discusses the ex exceptional friendship between Douglass and Garrison. And there's so much talk today about allyship and unity. And I think that this is a, a great text you know, to really give a historical context to what our potential is to work cooperatively Cooperatively. And at this time, without further ado, as she unmutes herself, right, I want to make sure I facilitate, you know, the way that I, I can make sure that we reduce the margin of error. And I present to you and represent to others, Neil Goon Okor. Thank you, doctor. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. 
Good morning, everybody. This is a privilege, as always. Uh, this conference has grown out of our conviction that we should highlight the efforts of the enslaved people, primarily, who dared to escape and who wanted nothing but freedom. So the credits go to them. When we speak about Underground Railroad, of course, there are many things we need to mention. But as Dr. Woski said in the beginning, out of this conference, uh, which is the 19th year this year, uh, grew other uh, tasks. One of them is recognizing Philadelphia's first martyr, Octavius Valentine Cato, with the help of Dr. Woski's work and his book on that. And Dr. Ade, uh, as you have met him now, uh, who introduced us, has also written articles on Kato. Uh, then we started uh, the tradition of leaving uh, a wreath and recognizing Kato on his birthday every February on the footsteps of that beautiful monument near the city hall, the south side. If you have never been there, please go look at that beautiful statue of Kato. He's important for us because he represents what we believe in. So what was this uh, conference about? Was it about railroads? Was it underground? Was it above ground? The first speaker of this conference years and years ago was Mr. Blackson. And this is how he started his speech. He said it had nothing to do with railroads. It was above the ground, never underground, but people do not seem to understand. So many theories and ideas existed and they continue to do so. But we at Temple, we have taken the challenge of defining and describing the Underground Railroad narrative to our students since 2004. But we are not done yet. We still have a lot to do. Dr. Woski has been a dynamo force in the development of this conference uh, with his unique perspective and immense knowledge of civil war, black troops, Camp William Penn. He has been able to summarize the stages of American history uh, for the rest of us, we owe him a lot. And I would not have been able to accomplish all of these things without the support of my college, College of Liberal Arts, without the support of my department and its consecutive chairs who reserved funds when we were meeting face to face. And of course, my colleagues uh, who are also joining us today, some of them are in the audience. I thank all of you very much, and especially Dr. Ade, Aaron Smith, for uh, mastering this task for us today with your skills. The people who played heroic roles in the development of the Underground Railroad history were those who chose to leave their places of enslavement by escape, flight, and deceit. They wanted to deceive the slave owners so they could achieve freedom. Yes, Underground Railroad was an act of defiance, an act of total rebellion against oppression and injustice. By using churches, residences, private offices, volunteers from both black and white communities in different parts of the US assisted and cultivated the largest and the most monumental act of defiance in American history. In support of freedom and for the sake of reforming American democracy and reconstituting it according to its initial principles of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for everybody. In my opinion, Underground Railroad was a dagger. It was a dagger thrust into the flesh of the systemic racism discrimination and oppression with the determination of dismantling slavery. It was initiated by the enslaved and it continued to achieve its goals with the helps of abolitionists, volunteers and conscientious citizens. The discourse of freedom that was triggered against unfreedom eventually toppled the system of oppression and the mechanism of evil was stopped. Harriet Tubman, William Still, Lucretia Mott, Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, and John Brown, and many, many others. They put their lives at risk. They set the model of truthful action, and they staged high responsibility for their followers. Their acts cannot be explained as, quotation marks, assistance. I'm against this. It was really uh, defiance and rebellion 
They were fearless believers and followers of truth and justice. They were ready and willing to pay the price and most of them paid a high price. In our 19th year, as we celebrate our legacy and mention these people's allegiance to truth and justice and democracy, we must remember the following. Freedom has a price to be paid. Those who pay the price are not necessarily vocal. Those who are truly committed may be engaged in a language that needs to be heard. In 1966, Dr. King said, a riot is the language of the unheard. Let all voices be heard, let no voices remain unheard. Today, we will hear about digitizing our research prospects and expanding it for sustainability of educational growth, which is our task. We look forward to listening to Dr. Menis, Dr. Bell, uh, our wonderful librarian, Jasmine uh, Clark, and of course, our incoming chair, uh, Timothy Welbeck for the Center of Race, Anti-Racism. I welcome you. I'm very proud of our work, our collective work, and I'm humbled by this opportunity. So welcome to the 19th Annual Underground Railroad and Black History Conference as Tem at Temple University. Thank you for being here. Uh, we're gonna introduce our first speaker, Dr. Bell. Wonderful. Dr. Bell is on screen. I want to introduce him to you. First of all, uh, Dr. Bell, thank you so much for being part of our conference. We look forward to hearing your informative paper. Uh, Dr. Bell, Dr. Richard Bell is professor of history at the University of Maryland and author of the book, Stolen. Uh, five free boys kidnapped into slavery and their astonishing odyssey home. This book was a finalist for the George Washington Prize and the Harriet Tubman Prize. Uh, Dr. Bell has held major research fellowships at Yale, Cambridge, and the Library of Congress, and he is the recipient of the National Endowment of the Humanities Public Scholar Award and the 2021 Andrew Carnegie Fellowship. He serves as a trustee of the Maryland Center for History and Culture and as a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. Dr. Bell comes to us from University of Maryland. And the title of the paper is Making Tracks, Naming and Framing the Afghan We welcome you, Professor. Thank you very much, uh, Nilda, much appreciated. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you to all of you for coming out to listen uh, to this first session tomorrow. I'm looking forward to this entire uh, conversation we're gonna have uh, today. I'm gonna begin by sharing my screen here, folks. Uh, Let's just make sure that technology works. I think as of now, you can see my screen, hear my voice, uh, see my face, good. Yes, nods, good. Um, and I think we've been blocked for about 45 minutes all told. Um, so I'm gonna use that in two ways. I'm gonna talk for about 30, 35 of those minutes and then open the, things up to your questions and comments. Um, so let's dive uh, right in. Uh, Colson Whitehead's 2016 novel, the Underground Railroad imagines an alternative reality in which subterranean locomotives actually exist in 1850s America. These steam belching engines tunnel up and down the East Coast of the United States and across the Midwest, and they are operated by black activists who proudly embrace their identities as conductors on a defiantly literal underground railroad. <laughs> now, let me say here, as has already been said, that for the record, this historical network to freedom that we call the Underground Railroad was of course neither underground nor actually a railroad. However, <laughs> this metaphor has long been in circulation used to describe the members of a small though active community of conscience who took direct action to assist fugitives from slavery in the decades right before the Civil War. 
a book by this name, The Underground Railroad, published by the black activist William Still in 1872, a book which shares its title with Colson Whitehead's recent novel, did much to popularize the concept of a secret anti-slavery iron road underground in the decades after the Civil War when it was published. And yet, historians don't know who first coined the phrase Underground Railroad, or when, how, or exactly why that phrase became popular. So the task I've set for myself this morning is to try to offer some preliminary answers to those important questions. The precise birth story of the peculiarly evocative metaphor of an underground railroad may never be known. In 1860, William Mitchell, a survivor of slavery, then living in Canada, told readers one origin story. Decades earlier, sometime in the early 1830s, he said, a freedom seeker from a Kentucky slave labor camp had fled into Ohio. His enslaver, Mitchell said, had tracked his escape to the banks of the Ohio River, only for the trail to run cold. The damned abolitionists must have a railroad under the ground by which they run off, n words, the man had growled in frustration before abandoning the pursuit. This, Mitchell said, this is the derivation of the term underground railroad. Well, maybe. Generations of activists and folklorists have long repeated some version of Mitchell's little story. Yeah, that story is very likely invented. Most scholars remain unconvinced. And my own research in major digital databases of early American newspapers and pamphlets can find no use of the phrase Underground Railroad in print prior to September 1842. That's when a tiny anti-slavery paper in Albany named The Toxin of Liberty, which is a great name for a newspaper, made tentative use of it. And before I go any further, I just want to say that that's my contribution today to have trolled through all these digital databases, which we're now inundated with, um, to look for the usages of this term and how it's changed over time. And this is, you know, digital humanities work that was impossible 10 years ago, 15 years uh, ago. Uh, other scholars have tried to ask some of these questions 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 60 years ago, in the case of Larry Gara, um, but they didn't have access to the extraordinary tools that you and I have uh, through major research uh, libraries today. So uh, I was able to use tools like um, uh, Redex and uh, ProQuest and uh, Gale to track uh, some of this. So hopefully that's a good fit for today's focus on digital um, humanities. So. In September 1842, we discover that's when a tiny anti-slavery paper in Albany called The Toxin of Liberty first made tentative use of the term. In a short notice, the one you can see on the screen, the toxin told readers that 26 freedom seekers had made it to Canada over the previous seven days and that all went by the underground Railroad, And if you're looking at the screen, notice the quotation marks they used for that phrase, the Underground Railroad. The presence of quotation marks around that phrase suggests to me that the phrase was new and unfamiliar. And it's notable that when several larger papers in upstate New York and New England reprinted this piece over the next several weeks, they preserved those quotation marks. It was new to them too. On October the 14th, the Liberator, the largest newspaper in the anti-slavery print network at the time, Garrison's newspaper, picked up the same brief news item, bringing this term to the attention of a broader number of activist readers. Following this early usage, universal adoption of the metaphor of an underground railroad to describe the network to freedom did not occur overnight. In prior decades, those activists had sometimes described themselves as forming a chain of friends or a line of posts. 
Others would continue to shun the business of naming and claiming entirely. When asked about his work helping fugitives, Arnold Gragston, a survivor of slavery, recalled that, I don't know as we called it anything. We just knew there was a lot of slaves always wanting to get free and I had to help them. Only gradually did the image of a subterranean railway for freedom seekers gain traction with the American reading public. Frederick Douglass referred to what they call the Underground Railroad in a brief passage in his 1845 autobiography in which he urged activists to be more guarded in their descriptions of its operations. By 1846, a year later, the metaphor was turning up in anti-slavery papers repeatedly. Now, more often than not, stripped of those early quotation marks. I mean, what did you say? By July that year, some editors and some authors were beginning to invoke the metaphor by its initials, U, G, R, R, or casually referring to it as the railroad the road, or the underground, all shorthand nicknames that would become increasingly common. It was the barrels of ink spilled over the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 and Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin two years later that would together finally propel this metaphor, the Underground Railroad, into popular usage. Newspaper editors in the anti-slavery press now wrote by the early 1850s with the assumption that their readers were familiar with the concept of an underground railroad and evidently felt it was no longer necessary to pause to define what it was. In the mainstream press, things were moving in the same direction, albeit a bit more slowly, and were still helped along by the occasional reminder or definition in August of 1854, for instance, New York's Evening Post explained that this phrase, the Underground Railroad, is frequently used in speaking of the escape of slaves as descriptive of the secret underhanded mode of conveying them to the free states by the abolition tribe. That same summer, the Picayune offered its own tutorial to subscribers down in New Orleans. UGRR. This reader means the Underground Railroad, by which slaves are run from the South through the North into Canada by those beauties, the abolitionists. My point here should now be pretty obvious, that by the mid-1850s, the term had achieved nearly universal recognition among the reading public. The network to freedom was now wholly synonymous with the conceit of a subterranean railroad, or as one 1853 Boston paper called it, this famous thoroughfare. And if you're looking at the screen, you'll see a graph that just popped up on the screen. Let me just explain what, the, what you're looking at here. This is a pretty blunt tool. This is called a Google Books Ngram Viewer. You've probably seen them. And this is tracking the usage in print um, in all the books that have been digitized by Google over the years of the phrase underground Railroad. Uh, I've set it to 1840 to 1861. So this data visualization plots date of publication on the x-axis and then the frequency with which a designated term appears in the corpus of scanned texts via Google Books on the y-axis and the trend lines have been smoothed. And basically this graph confirms what I just told you. Blunt tool. Though. To understand why this strange metaphor gained such traction. We should surely begin by acknowledging the cultural power of real railroads at this time in US history. As the conceit of a subterranean freedom railway began to grip the American imagination, real tracks were being laid across America. And those railways, railways were new and exciting. They were front page news, in fact. And the short bulletins in the newspapers describing the latest exploits of the Underground Railroad often sat cheek by jowl alongside news items describing real railways of one sort or another. 
The first stretch of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, a hugely ambitious project to link Maryland to the Great Lakes, had opened in 1830. It set off a frenzy of copycat projects across the nation. Every year after that, steam engines grew more efficient and the trains they pulled got faster and faster. In 1831, a locomotive covered the 17 miles between Albany and Schenectady in just 38 minutes at a mind boggling pace of, wait for it, 23 miles an hour. Can you believe it? By 1840, laborers had laid 3,000 miles of track in the United States, most of it in the corridor between Washington and Boston. Over the next two decades, as you can see on this screen, that extremely fragmented network would begin to consolidate and would reach ever westward, connecting the Atlantic coast to Western Pennsylvania, Western New York, and then Ohio and Indiana, and on and on. What's more, almost from their inception, railroads drew the attention of fugitives from slavery, who saw in all that iron and smoke and speed a new path out of human bondage. Indeed, one obvious reason that the metaphor of an underground railroad gained currency in America in these decades was the early and expanding overlap between freedom seeking and railway travel. On September the 3rd, 1838, Baltimore's Fred Bailey became one of the very first enslaved Americans to take a train to freedom. Using a one-way ticket purchased for him by his fiance and a borrowed ID, Bailey put on sailor clothes to disguise himself and boarded a train heading northward. When the train pulled out of the station near the Baltimore docks, he held his breath as the conductor inspected his documents. Those few seconds must have seemed like years. But then it was all over. The conductor handed them back and moved on. The journey towards Wilmington and then onward to New York must have seemed endless. But finally, he stepped off the train onto free soil. A few weeks later, Fred Bailey changed his name to Frederick Douglass. Many more fugitives would follow in Douglas's wake. And two years later, a piece in one anti-slavery paper noted how these railroads had quickly become a means of emancipation. Thanks to the miracle of train travel, the editor of the Colored American noted, a poor fugitive may leave Baltimore in the morning and the third night following may find himself safely in Canada. This seemed like time travel. This seemed extraordinary and wondrous. And this newspaper editor longed for the day when railroad lines would fully penetrate the lower South and the cotton kingdom as well, offering a new passage to liberty for the many hundreds of thousands of enslaved people held captive all the way down there. In the meantime, railroads and running away from slavery became increasingly synonymous. Anyone who could get to a railhead, forge some freedom papers and raise the funds to buy a ticket could try their luck on the cars, as they were called at the time. Most traveled as solo passengers like Douglas. Some took their chances in small groups like William and Ellen Craft, a married couple. Others still sealed themselves inside pine boxes and had friends deliver them to the nearest station as cargo to be dispatched northwards in the baggage car. Henry Brown would do just that in Richmond, Virginia in 1848. His box was just three feet long, dimensions that forced him to crouch in the fetal position. His box was stored upside down for most of the time, so the journey northward was not just terrifying, but excruciating. After 27 hours squashed like that, Henry Brown arrived in Philadelphia where he was unboxed by members of the city's Vigilance Committee of Anti-Slavery Activists. How do you do, Jen? How do you do, gentlemen? Brown said, rising gingerly to his feet and extending his hand, and then he promptly fainted. 
for the rest of his life, everyone called him Henry Box Brown. I'm sure you know that. Only a small number of fugitives who traveled by railroad were ever recaptured. Other forms of escape and exodus on the nation's waterways, roads, and paths all saw plenty of traffic in the last 10 years before the Civil War, but railroads were now the means of choice for those who could get to them. And most accounts written by those who fled slavery in the 1850s mention rail travel as a central feature of their escape. It would be a mistake, however, to conclude that the rise of railroads explains everything. Newspapers, pamphlets, and books published in the two decades before the Civil War all made clear that the Underground Railroad was a broad and all-encompassing movement that assisted freedom seekers by almost any means possible. Indeed, in many places beyond the Atlantic coast, this metaphor and all its related vocabulary ran far ahead of real railroads. For much of the 1840s, at least, the Underground Railroad was the metaphor of choice for people in many towns and cities that had no rail connection. Metaphors, by definition, are creative constructions. Metaphors are figures of speech that refer to one thing by invoking something else entirely. They're really condensed analogies. And linguists agree that metaphors are central to the way most of us represent and understand our daily experiences. Importantly, metaphors are not only ubiquitous in everyday language, but also very powerful. As the linguists George Lakoff and Mark Johnson have demonstrated, our acceptance of a metaphorical concept typically works to highlight certain features of an experience while obscuring others, which is to say metaphors can define our reality. They can channel our imagination and they can shape our options for action. We draw inferences, we set goals, we make commitments, we execute plans, Lakoff and Johnson explain, all on the basis of how we in part structure our experience, consciously and unconsciously, by means of metaphor. Metaphors have great power. And it's my argument this morning that the conceit of an underground railroad broadcast several structuring arguments about the nature of freedom seeking in pre-Civil War America. And in the time I have left, I want to explain some of those structuring arguments briefly. First, this odd little metaphor worked to imply a reach that belied the localized, ad hoc, and often informal nature of much of the network's actual operations. As real railroads began to cross state lines and ranged ever further across space, the metaphor brought to mind a superstructure of impressive scale and integration. Second, the corporate business-related dimensions of the metaphor of an underground railroad summoned to mind imposing notions of centralization and operational coordination. Real railroads were new and exciting business enterprises in the period. They were pioneers of modern corporate management. The conceit of a subterranean railway, railway whisking freedom seekers away from slavery thus played upon assumptions that railroads were sites of managerial and logistical efficacy. Third, the idea that this network was akin to a real railway company also furnished network agents with potent tools to attract funding for their work. The conceit of an underground railroad endowed boosters with a vocabulary that transfigured charitable donations into dividend-bearing investments 
in a highly successful capitalist enterprise. In this framing, donors to the cause of freedom were stockholders of this road. And supporters and critics alike often describe the ebb and flow of financial contributions to the Underground Railroad in terms of its notional share price. As a newspaper in Maine reported in 1846, the stock is several percent above par. Dividend will probably be declared soon. Fourth, a suite of related vocabulary entailed in this grand metaphor allowed supporters of the Underground Railroad to highlight the security and reliability of the network to freedom. At a time when real railroad journeys were getting faster and faster, and the safety of railroad travel was hotly debated, this meant lots of talk in the papers about the speed and safety of the network to freedom. Describing the safe arrival of a family of 15 fugitives via the Underground Railroad, one paper asserted that rarely does a collision occur. No awful accident has happened upon it for some time. Another paper agreed. Our trains never come in collision with each other, declared a third. Our conductors are always sober, wide awake, and on the lookout. You get the point. Finally, the metaphor of an underground railroad also drew considerable power from its conceptual associations with the clandestine, the invisible, and the ineffable. In this formation, the word underground signaled covert resistance, a civil disobedience campaign working to fight tyranny and oppression in the heart of the nation that seems to us today broadly analogous to the resistance movements in Nazi-occupied France or Poland in World War II. By such means, boosters worked to link the covert nature of underground railroad activities to righteousness. Describing any black person's journey out of slavery as a pilgrimage to the North Star or as an exodus from Egypt. The biblical prophet Moses, they explained, had laid the first track through the Red Sea and had been the Underground Railroad's first conductor. In these renderings, the pre-Civil War network to freedom was not only secretive, it was also celestial, chartered by God and incorporated by the higher law. For all these reasons then, the metaphor of an underground railroad proved remarkably durable, asserting itself as a fixture of national arguments about slavery and sectionalism within just a few years of its debut in print. After the destruction of slavery in the Civil War, memoirs published by those claiming direct involvement with the pre-war network to freedom worked to further enshrine the metaphor of an underground railroad at the center of American memory. In so doing, they offered recollections that implied that organized efforts to assist freedom seekers before the war had indeed been vigorous, coordinated, and widespread. For a long time, scholars digested those claims wholly uncritically. An historian named Wilbur Siebert certainly did. In his 1898 history of the Underground Railroad, Siebert described it as a great system, a widespread institution, and a series of hundreds of interlocking lines. To visualize this chain of stations leading from the southern states to Canada, Siebert included in his book a map of regular routes to freedom on the Underground Railroad that has frequently been reprinted since then. I'm sure you recognize this. And as you can see, those routes on that map 
they looked for all the world like fixed, permanent railroad lines. But in truth, they were largely the product of his own imagination. Siebert also identified 3,211 agents of the Underground Railroad by name. On inspection, it turns out that most of the names on Siebert's list belong to white men. A demographic profile very much at odds with the fact that free black activists had actually done the lion's share of this heroic work. Wilbur Siebert saw railways everywhere. And by the time his history of the Underground Railroad appeared in print in 1898, they were everywhere. That year, the United States boasted more than 175,000 miles of track, including two long distance transcontinental routes linking the Atlantic coast to the Pacific. A handful of cities in Europe and America had by then actually built subterranean, steam powered subway systems. Boston's had opened the year before in 1897. And by that time, London's famous Metropolitan Line, a cut and cover commuter railway under the streets, had been in bustling business for more than three decades. Throughout the 1850s and early 1860s, construction updates from that pioneering civil engineering project in the British capital had been the subject of repeated reporting in the American newspaper press typically under the headline, you could guess, Underground Railroad. On January the 10th, 1863, nine days after Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation wrenched American history off its rails, London's first four mile long stretch of track in tunnel finally opened after years of delays, accidents, and cost overruns. Media coverage of its opening on both sides of the Atlantic was largely rapturous, with columnists praising the conceivers of that project in London as latter-day Galileos, who had brought into being a new wonder for the modern world. For some, however, the news from beneath the streets of London seemed trivial compared to what was happening on the other side of the ocean at the time. In the early months of 1863, the American Civil War was plowing towards its second bloody anniversary. In comparison, the opening of the London Underground seemed like a frivolous footnote to history. But what of this? One American rider on Britain's new subterranean sensation asked readers back home in Washington that spring. But what of this? We in America have had an underground railway of our own for many years. I'm gonna stop right there. Um, I'm gonna look for some comments and questions and I'll just show you my email address on the screen in case anyone wants to be in touch uh, privately. Um, about this. Nilgun, do you have a, a best practice for how you want to handle questions and things? Of course. Thank you. First of all, uh, Dr. Bell, this was, uh, this was an enormous uh, enterprise you have taken. You summarized everything for us. It is so valuable. We thank you. And I really want to give you celebrations. Thank you very much. So my students will join me and anyone else. We enjoyed it. Uh, I'm going to ask if Dr. Ade, Aaron Smith, is still with us. Uh, if not, I will conduct the Q&A session. Any questions, please uh, unmute yourselves and ask if you have any questions, comments to Dr. Bell. Please, you are welcome. Hello, anyone? Not yet? Okay, I have a question. Uh, I will start. I'm sure there will be other questions and comments. Again, congratulations, Dr. Bell. You summarized whatever we needed to hear, and this was a great opening for our conference. 
thank you so much for your time and efforts to compile all these precious maps, documents, uh, quotations from newspapers. Uh, this is my question. It's really not a question. Is there a question? Okay, it's coming up probably. Here is what I want to know. Uh, we can listen to you another hour. If this was not um, approved by the government, of course, uh, what were some of the actions that were taken against all this publication, all these metaphorical allusions to the railroad? How did the government agencies uh, try to stop them? I know what they did to, uh, to the people who were trying to escape if they ever found out. And I know everybody was at risk, including Tubman and William Still uh, and Douglas himself when he was forced to escape to Britain because of the fugitive slave law. But how was the government and agencies acting upon all this publication and publicity? What was their reaction? Yeah, so it's a great question. Thank you uh, for that. And thanks for breaking the ice as well. Hopefully other people will follow in your wake and pose a question or make a comment in the time we have um, uh, left. So I think that um, if we look around modern America today, we see the federal government is very powerful, very powerful indeed. Uh, right. And so I think um, we often tend to assume that that's always been the case, that the federal government has always been this giant bureaucratic behemoth, right, with millions of people on its uh, payroll reaching into every aspect of our lives. And I think historians of the federal state and of state power would say that that's a post-Civil War phenomenon, right? That uh, uh, Arguably, it's the US Civil War, which dramatically expands the power and people and payroll um, of the federal government, moving it into the sort of modern era. And so, you know, before the Civil War, um, the federal government is a relatively small number of people with a relatively small budget compared to what's about to happen in the Civil uh, War. And when you think of the federal government in your neighborhood, you're probably thinking of the postman. And then otherwise, you really can't think of any, any representative of the federal government who lives lives close by, unless you live in Washington, D.C. Um, <laughs> so what that means, Nilgut, of course, is that, you know, the idea that there's um, the equivalent of the FBI um, hanging out at every train depot, checking everyone's uh, papers to stop fugitives uh, using this very real uh, network, uh, this railroad network to achieve um, uh, freedom uh, is, I think, a, you know, a post-Civil War um, uh, invention. And even state power is also limited in cer certain ways. So companies, um, are really encouraged to be the ones regulating themselves and enforcing um, their own right to ride um, uh, uh, policies, uh, for instance, uh, who has the right to ride and who doesn't. And, you know, my understanding of the literature, Nilgan, if you know better, please correct me, um, is that, you know, you can find as a uh, a broad variety of enforcement. Uh, you can find some individuals who are very zealous uh, in making sure that everyone's papers are thoroughly checked, that hard questions are asked, asked and that people are thrown off the trains if there's any doubt as to whether they're free black people or uh, fugitives from slavery pretending to be um, uh, black people, uh, pretending to be free, um, uh, free people, excuse me. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum, there's a reassuringly significant number of railroad employees who are willing to help. That This is one of the great ironies about the metaphor, Nilgen, is that there are actual conductors on real railroads who work as conductors on the metaphorical railroad, if you see the wordplay um, uh, there. And uh, same with the newspapers, right? So much of the discourse that you, know, you were flagging uh, in your remarks there is in the newspapers. And the federal government is just not in the business um, of putting its finger um, on press coverage in any meaningful way. Um, there's not much of a history of federal originated uh, censorship when it comes to this sort of thing um, uh, in the in the free press. So I should probably do some more work to unpack both of those uh, sides of it. But my sense is this is a concern that people have, but it's not the prime obstacle making it, you know, preventing um, uh, freedom seekers. It's overzealous 
um, uh, railway um, employees uh, and its uh, you know constables and sheriffs and other local officials of uh, law enforcement. And of course, it's a white civilian population, Nilgan, many of whom are surprisingly zealous in policing the color line, right? Uh, who feel like their own lives de de depend on making sure black people don't get free. That's the great tragedy of American racism, right? Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you, Dr. Bell. That was wonderfully explained. Uh, we understand similar situations existed, uh, especially in David Walker's case, when he was able to secretly send his pamphlet to the South with the help of his captain friends, sailor friends. Uh, that's another interesting story of uh, deceit. Uh, and he was successful. Are there any questions from the group, from our audiences? Anything in the chat? Uh, Dr. Ade, do you see any in the chat or? Okay, I don't hear much. Well then, uh, Dr. Bell, one more time, we thank you so much uh, for all your efforts and this beautiful presentation. I'm sure everybody would like to have a copy of your speech and some of your slides. Uh, I may borrow a few to use in my classrooms, but one more time, Thank you. We celebrate you and congratulate you. It was wonderfully done. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to everyone else's presentations today. I've just dropped my email address in the chat in case people want to follow up with other questions. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, there's will... one question right here. There's a question from Madison that just came in, yes. came in as we were speaking um, there. Madison says, and I'm reading this for the first time, Madison says, in the age of ancestry, many people are able to access millions of documents digitally to trace their genealogy. Do you think that there are missing records and documents from the Underground Railroad that should be shared on these platforms as well? I mean, I appreciate the question. I think it's an easy thing to say yes, right? Um, so Ancestry is what Ancestry.com and Family Search and other sort of genealogical websites are wonderful um, uh, tools. Many of them have millions of dollars of billions of dollars, maybe, if funding behind them. Um, and uh, in one case is tied to a faith group, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as you probably um, uh, no, and the actual number of primary documents which are now visible to users of ancestry and searchable um, to users of ancestry, I think is growing at an exponential rate. You know, I, I just finished Madison, a project uh, which resulted in a book called Oh, now the questions are pouring in. Um, we just finished. I <laughs> uh, just finished a book called Stolen. You might be able to see it over one of my ears there. Um, and that involved at the end some uh, African American genealogical uh, work. And uh, it was very clear to me that the things I was able to find via Ancestry and Family Search and other tools simply wouldn't have been available to me ten years earlier unless I'd taken a plane to Salt Lake City. Um, to go to the Family History Center there, where so many of these genealogical records are now uh, housed. Does that mean, Madison, that Ancestry has everything? Absolutely not. Archivists, I'm not an archivist, but we have some, I think, librarians and archivists on this call. I think they would tell you that um, maybe 5% uh, of manuscript records have so far been digitized in one form or another, and just because they've been digitized doesn't mean they've all ended up in the same place on the same platform like Ancestry. They could end up in any number of DH, digital history, digital humanities um, uh, platforms. So there's a ton more work to be done to digitize these materials, which is incredibly expensive, um, uh, by the way. So for those of you, um, uh, you know, sitting at home with your computers and your subscriptions, you will continue to get more hits the longer you keep at this and i don't think there will ever be a perfect alternative there is another question thank you uh, dr bell this is one of my questions from swak sarpong hello swak uh, his question is what was the mode of communication for the people that traveled using the railroad what are some of the challenges that they possibly faced? Uh, this is a very good question. Yeah, it's absolutely, <laughs> right. I mean, I think someone needs to come, come in and give a presentation about that, right? And I'm maybe not the best person to do that because um, I think there's a lot we don't know yet, Swak, about uh, all that sort of stuff. What I can tell you uh, is a couple of things, and they're gonna seem like they're at odds with each other. 
on the one hand, um, there are real limits to how fully and accurately um, uh, fugitives from slavery can communicate with people who want to offer them help or who are willing to assist them. Um, and we know, by the way, that you know most fugitives from slavery um, embark on that journey towards freedom on their own with no one holding their hand metaphorically or otherwise, right? They're on their own for the first and most dangerous portions um, of their um, escape. And people like Harriet Tubman who would go into the slave South are extremely rare in the larger history of um, people helping um, fugitives from slavery. So you're on your own at the start. That's the first thing I wanna say. And you can't be certain of help until help appears. Um, on the other hand, and this is going to seem like I'm contradicting myself, um, for some of the best established um, conductors and station agents on the Underground Railroad, people like um, William Still being a great example in Philadelphia, they wrote letters um, and even sent telegrams to other people in their unofficial network, um, alerting them to incoming um, arrivals of fugitives and saying, look out for this person at this place at this time. Sometimes they wrote in code, sometimes they really didn't. They just wrote very upfront letters about what they were talking about. And that reminds us that the level of secrecy here really depends on who you think, think is observing you, right? In a private letter, you really don't think the federal government is opening your mail because they're not. Um, but of course, um, you know, if you're Harriet Tubman and you're sneaking back into the slave state of Maryland, you need to take every possible uh, precaution. So different levels of secrecy and who you think you're talking to um, often determines how you communicate and how um, candid you are in your communication. But if you read William Still's letters, for instance, he talks about what he's doing all the time. True. Yeah. Um, there's a comment. Thank you so much uh, for the question and for the response. Uh, another question from Madison. Uh, Dr. Bell, uh, are you able to read it? Yeah, I see bits of it here. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a long one. Madison's uh, saying, I'm curious if Canada has any kind of records of freedom seekers uh, from the UGRR. I think the short answer is yes, uh, Madison. Uh, I'm not the perfect person to answer that, of course, because I've yet to do manuscript research on the Canadian side of the line. Uh, but I can tell you that um, the um, several of the most vocal um, newspaper editors and uh, black activists uh, are resident in Canada, in West Canada, as it's known, Ontario, uh, around the Detroit area, um, and are writing in Canadian papers and in American papers that they're sort of fueling with reportage. Um, and Henry Bibb is the great example here of a black fugitive from America who goes to Canada and becomes the Canadian face of the Underground Railroad on that part uh, of the network. And he's one of the most funny and inventive commentators on the usage of the term. He has lots of fun with the term. He says, for instance, you know, um, 15 pieces of black freight came across the bridge into Ontario last night. You know what? It was a miracle. As soon as they crossed that bridge, those freight, they became humans. They became people. Once again, he has fun with that metaphor. That's so beautiful. Are there any questions that we skipped and couldn't see? Would you please uh, verbalize it if we couldn't uh, catch it? I don't want I have a to- question. Go what ahead. Was, what was so special about Canada? Oh, sure. Great question. What was so special about Canada was the question there. Um, so Canada abolishes slavery in the 1830s when the British Empire abolishes uh, slavery. And so what that means is because Canada is a separate country from the United States, um, there's nothing that American slaveholders can legally do to get you back from Canada if you've escaped slavery in America and made it across that uh, line. So Canada's regarded as free soil uh, in a way that's different to the free soil of Massachusetts or Pennsylvania or Ohio, which the constitution says and the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 says that fugitives from slavery can run to Massachusetts or Pennsylvania or Ohio, but slaveholders always have the right to grab them and take them home. 
That, of course, doesn't apply to Canada because Canada's a different country. So that boundary line between two countries, one of which slavery is the law of the land, the United States, and one of which is slavery is illegal, that matters a great deal to black fugitives from slavery. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. I think I do not see there's one more. Is that a question? Uh, Sean Cooper is asking, can we get a copy of this webinar once it is completed? Uh, I think you can because uh, we are recording it. Uh, this will be on YouTube, by the way. Everybody, uh, we will be on uh, for we will be in history. We will be recorded. You can go back and watch it and listen. So if you have other questions, please direct them to Dr. Bell or myself. We will be happy to respond. Uh, I'm so glad this first session, our opening session went so well, so informative. Now we are more excited than ever. <laughs> we have to get together more often and um, I will share my ideas with uh, Dr. Bell and Dr. Menis once we complete this seminar. Uh, we need to do another conference, maybe once every six months. There's so much interest, so we will be in touch. And if you want to stay on our email list so you can be a part of it with your writings, with your questions, please send me an email at anadolu at temple.edu. All right, Dr. Bell, once again, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate and we congratulate you for this wonderful paper. Thanks very much, everyone, appreciate it. Thank you. I am. I know my students are still with me, but some of them have to leave. So we will be losing some of our audiences. Uh, I understand. Uh, thank you for being here. If you have to go, please leave. Uh, or if you can stay, we will be very happy. Uh, I want to introduce our second keynote speaker. And uh, our second speaker is Dr. Jeremy Menis from Temple University. I will be very happy to present him and his, read his bio to you. Uh, Dr. Jeremy Menes is a professor in the Department of Geography and Urban Studies, College of Liberal Arts at Temple University. His research focuses on geographic information systems, which is GIS, and the geospatial analysis of environmental and social contexts of health. He has served as president of the University Consortium for Geographic Information Science, which is UCGIS. Uh, he has been board director for the GIS Certification Institute, which is GISCI, and also as associate editor of the CDC journal, Preventing Chronic Disease. Dr. Menes received a doctorate in geography from Pennsylvania State University, and he is a certified GIS professional. His paper is titled, Mapping the Historical Landscapes of the Underground Railroad in Maryland's Eastern Shore, a GIS okay. approach. Uh, this paper and his presentation will focus on the historical landscapes of the Underground Railroad in Maryland's Eastern Shore with a focus on landscape features that may have presented places of risk or protection during escape from slavery. So we welcome you to listen to Dr. Manis's very original uh, paper. And I believe it is the first time he is going to speak about uh, Underground Railroad using his GIS systems. Uh, He's launching a new research and I'm so happy and uh, humbled with the content of his research. Thank you, Dr. Menis. We are happy to be able to listen to you. You are welcome. Thanks so much for that kind introduction. Uh, much appreciated. I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, can you give me a thumbs up that you can see that? and hear me? Okay, right on, thank you. Um, so first, um, let me thank uh, Dr. Anadolu Kerr and the Department of Africology and African American Studies for having me speak. 
Uh, it's really an honor to be here and uh, I really enjoyed Dr. Bell's presentation. I'm looking forward to the others too. Um, in, in the introduction, you heard a lot about geography and GIS um, and not much about uh, history or African-American history or the Underground Railroad. And I probably, I actually wanna start with a little disclaimer that I, I don't know very much about African-American history or the Underground Railroad. Um, my expertise is in GIS and um, I've sort of made a bit of a career on, on bringing kind of the geographic approach to different topics and um, most, most recently public health. <clears throat> and it's been really fun and exciting. And I've really been inspired to um, uh, start an investigation in this topic. It's such a fascinating area. Uh, I know also that when, um, uh, from my academic experience, when one talks about um, an area that one doesn't have a lot of domain knowledge in, it's a dangerous game to play. Um, and I just uh, ask you for your patience. And, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just so, um, uh, you know, happy just to be able to join this conversation and, and contribute to it, hopefully in some way. And I really look forward um, to learning, uh, you know, from everyone who's here. So just thank you for so much for this opportunity. Um, I wanna talk about um, the Underground Railroad in uh, Maryland's Eastern Shore and how we might use geographic information systems, which is a mapping technology um, to better understand um, the, the Underground Railroad in this particular location. Um, I, I got interested in this by being in the Eastern Shore and having the opportunity to be uh, in these particular places um, that played such a vital role in uh, the Underground Railroad. Now, the Eastern Shore is, of course, where um, Harriet Tubman um, was born um, and grew up and where much of her operations were in helping people escape from slavery. Um, it's close by and I'm familiar with it to some extent, and that's why I chose to focus on this particular area. Um, while I was down um, in uh, the eastern shore of Maryland, which lies along the eastern shore of the Chesapeake Bay, um, uh, in Cambridge, um, uh, which is in Dorchester County, uh, I saw this mural there. And as a geographer, you know, what I'm really interested in is the landscape, um, the environment, and the role of the environment in shaping people's behavior the interaction of individuals with their environment. And I became really fascinated by the role of these environmental features in the Underground Railroad in this particular place. And there's a couple examples of that I just, I just wanna show you. So this is a mural that, that is in uh, Cambridge, which is the largest town in Dorchester County, Maryland, where Harriet Tubman was born. Um, and there's such great symbolism here for this idea of the importance of the environment in the Underground Railroad. You can see Harriet Tubman reaching out through a brick wall, the brick wall sort of obviously symbolizing a barrier to freedom, but it's also a juxtaposition of the built environment with the brick wall and what's behind it. Um, she's reaching across the brick wall to take your hand away from this built environment, this area into this, um, you know, nature area, which is behind her. And you can see sort of this untamed vegetation that's sort of growing. You can see the waterways behind her. And it suggests that those, um, you know, types of environmental features, the concealment offered by the untamed vegetated areas, the, the transportation, and opportunities for travel offered by the waterways, and especially with the boat, um, the rowboats you can see behind her, the importance of those environmental features to the operation of the Underground Railroad. And I just thought that was so fascinating and the way it was depicted in this mural um, that's in this town. I, I was also inspired by um, this book that um, uh, Nogan let me actually, which I was really fascinated by, which uh, offered a bunch of imagery uh, of people and places um, that you know, were part of the Underground Railroad across the United States. And in many of the photographs that occurred in this particular book, you can see a lot of landscape features. Now it's all of places. So there's a lot of you know, pictures of houses, but then a lot of the pictures are of rooms in the house or people. 
um, and so on. But a lot of them are more, you know, landscape orientation. So this is, um, you know, one such photograph of, you know, a marshy area, a water area. Um, you can see again, the vegetated area. You don't see, you know, a dense housing or anything like that. It's not built up. And one thing I was struck by, you know, in reading this and looking at this and, and being in the Eastern Shore was the role of these environmental features in providing both risk and protection. You know, risk in the sense that, you know, you could run into um, people and developed areas that represented danger in uh, an effort to escape, to be recaptured or something like that. On the other hand, environmental features such as water and vegetated areas offered concealment, transportation, perhaps the ability to, you know, capture wild game. I mean, this is speculation for me, frankly, but, um, you know, you could see the important role and that, you know, that's sort of captured by these photographs and, and the text that you see here. So that was very inspiring in terms of thinking about the landscape offering, um, you know, potential for risk and protection during escape uh, attempts in this particular area. So for me, my research questions, you know, in the project here are, what was the role of the social build and natural environment in the development and function of the Underground Railroad in this region in Maryland's Eastern Shore? And notice when I talk about the environment, I'm not just talking about nature. I'm not talking just about trees and things like that. I'm also talking about the social environment, uh, meaning that network of people um, that were able to have communications about where to go, when to go, um, how to go and things like that um, in terms of escapes and the built environment, the transportation networks, roads, the built areas, the churches, um, the places of refuge and so on, and how those all fit together. And what's interesting is how these environmental characteristics intersected with the agency of individuals. I mean, remember it's individuals that are doing the escaping, it's their own agency that's creating the Underground Railroad itself, but there's an enemy in an interaction between those environmental systems, those larger structures and the agency of behaviors of these individual people. And that, that's a geographic question and that's what, what's really driving me here. In terms of the specific objectives, um, when I think about what I wanna do for this research, it's first to represent and analyze how these features of the landscape may have conferred these elements of risk and protection to those escaping from slavery. And once you sort of represent those features of landscape and protection, uh, risk and protection, it's about taking the individual narratives of particular people escaping slavery and to try and put them into that historical geographic context to elicit that interaction. And you know, more broadly in terms of the broader impacts of something like this, I love to be able to contribute to public history the popular understanding of the Underground Railroad and how it worked, particularly in this particular place of Maryland's Eastern Shore. What I'm gonna talk about today is, is really kind of my first step, which is about representing these landscape elements of risk and protection. Um, I'd like to introduce you to my perspective on this. I, this sounds like a topic really far afield from what I've been doing for the last you know, 20 years of my career, which is mostly around public health. And ironically, it's really not. I mean, for me, this is really a natural progression. Um, but just to tell you where I'm coming from, I've been doing research into how individuals interact with their social built and natural environment for a long time. But I have been focusing mostly on health behaviors, particularly substance use. Um, and you know, one of the most important conceptual frameworks is the social ecological model, which was sort of first proposed by uh, Braun von Brenner in the late 70s and, and um, developed in the 80s and 90s. The idea is that you know, people's behaviors and development um, from youth into uh, you know, adolescence and adulthood is formed by a biological characteristics at the core of the individual, sex, age, and so on. But it's the interactions with the structures around them that are really important to understand. So the interaction uh, with their family and peers, that would be called the microsystem right here. Um, their school, places of worship, and so on. This is their day-to-day -day lives and interactions. But those 
day-to-day -day interactions are nested within broader structures. The industry, the media they're exposed to, the political systems, the neighborhood and their community, um, and so on. Uh, and even more broadly in a macro system, it's about the attitudes and ideologies of the broader culture and so on. It's the interactions between these different levels that you know, actually influence um, an individual's behavior. And I've been looking at this, of course, for things like when does someone you know, um, decide to you know, use drugs? Um, when, do they, when does an adolescent perhaps enter into or initiate into substance use and so on? What's the trajectory of substance use? But I think this framework is really just as applicable to broader understandings of how people interact with their um, environment and how you know, those broader structures influence their own agency and behaviors and so on. Um, the way that we materialize these uh, landscape features for this kind of public health research is through technology called geographic information systems, which if you're not familiar, you can basically think like a think of it as a digital representation of these different map layers, which you see on the right here. So we basically have maps and computers. That's a good way to think of it. And we have maps of all these different layers, like the transportation networks, the buildings, um, you know, imagery, aerial photographs, different types of land cover, residential, vegetated, agricultural, uh, the locations of rivers, the land surface itself, waterways, you know, political boundaries, all these different things are different maps. Um, and those can be integrated together into, you know, a, a software package or something that you kind of see on the left. So this would be one example of a software package that integrates these, you know, different layers. And that's basically how I conduct my research on how people interact with their environment by acquiring and integrating all of these different digital representations of the features of the surface of the earth and putting them in a computer. And you know, this is an example of the kind of thing that, that you know, I do with the GIS. So, so we're looking at um, African-American youth in Philadelphia and their substance use trajectories. And we track these youth for um, uh, a, a year or so. And in order to understand how, what environments they were basically encountering on their daily lives, we collected data on features of the environment that we theorized to be risky versus protective. So we collected things like pawn shops, check cashing stores, corner stores that you know, sold alcohol, bars and restaurants that sold alcohol. These are things that you know, we theorized might present places of risk um, to adolescents and other places that might confer some kind of protective element to their interactions in places such as recreation centers, Head Start partners, after school programs, and so on. And we just map them onto, onto Philadelphia. So this is West Philadelphia right here. And you can see that each one of these points represents a particular um, type of feature in the environment, those that perhaps confer protect, uh, risk and those that confer protection um, for those individuals as they encounter these places throughout their daily lives. Now, of course, now that we have these places, we have to represent the specific locations that any individual might go throughout their daily life to try and figure out what kind of exposures they have to these different features. So we collected data on the places um, that individuals went. So this is a visualization package that we developed, customized off of a software package called ArcGIS. Um, and the points here on this map represent the individual location, the, the locations for one individual is what we call their activity space. So their home, a place that they identified was a safe place for them, a place that they identified as risky. We asked them where they went, how long they spent there, when they went there, why it was risky or safe, and so on. And we basically measured their exposure to these different features and tried to develop models of their substance use initiation and trajectories that might be related to their exposures to different um, elements in the environment. I should point out that this doesn't actually represent any individual person. 
We've randomized these locations so that you can't identify any individual person um, from the data that I'm presenting here. So that's an important part of this. Um, but we did have the actual data for individuals. And, you know, other people have done this type of thing. This is a work by May Pro Kwan um, looking at the trajectory of um, individuals. So this is a city. The lines here represent the trajectory of an individual person as they move about as they move about their daily life throughout the day. So they're coming from their home, they're going to be at home, and they're moving across the city. They're going to stop in one particular place, go somewhere else. So this is what we call a space-time path. It's a it's a path where in the, the Z dimension, the third dimension over a map right here, you see movement throughout the day. And we have, in this particular case, not we, but Maypo Kwan and her colleagues have basically text narrative information that they ask them, uh, in this case, um, Muslims in a post 9-11 uh, world about their fears, um, their feelings of safety, um, their worries and their experiences moving throughout their daily lives um, throughout the world. And through this narrative, you can map their feelings throughout their daily life. Do they feel safe here? Do they feel um, at risk of being attacked? Are they happy, sad, and so on? So it's a combination of a qualitative analysis of this text and mapping it onto places um, that a person goes throughout their daily lives. This has been used in the digital humanities as well. This is an example by um, Albert Giordano and his work on um, the Holocaust. So this is a map of um, Budapest, um, a map from uh, the 1940s during World War II. Uh, this is a street network right here. And the locations of individual residences of Jewish households there. And the marketplaces that they needed to go to are these red um, sort of building symbols right here. And the, the width of the blue lines that you see overlaid on the street network is the likelihood of a Jewish person running into a, a, a place of danger, trying to get to the marketplace at a certain time in order to get something to eat. They had to go from their home to the marketplace to eat. But every time they did, there was a chance of running into, um, you know, uh, Nazi, what they call Nazi perpetrators here. And every time that run-in could happen, it was a, a, a serious risk that they could be captured and not end up going home. So mapping these places of risk um, as they conducted their daily activities necessary for survival. And this was... Um, uh, the, basically, a GIS was used to basically represent these places and these types of interactions. You can visualize the places and times of risk for these particular people in this situation. And this has been extended also to um, uh, the Underground Railroad. And it may have been done in other contexts. I'm still doing research on this. But I found this was really, really interesting. Um, in the previous presentation by Dr. Bell, there was... Um, a uh, presentation of Siebert's uh, map of the Underground Railroad. Well, this work by Dr. Cheryl LaRoche basically takes other data uh, about uh, free black settlements um, in the United States prior to uh, emancipation and maps it onto Siebert's roots. So you can see, for instance, these free black settlements are in blue right here. Uh, the roots are in um, the orange right here, and we're mapping them on top of each other and seeing where they might overlie and where they might differ. Um, so this is a quite interesting approach to gathering this historical data, digitizing it, and representing uh, these different features of the landscape. I want to talk a little bit about how those approaches inspired me to do this research on the Eastern Shore. And by the Eastern Shore, I mean uh, this place here. Uh, this is the Eastern Shore of the Chesapeake Bay. This is Maryland, Washington, D.C. Philadelphia is up here off the map to the northeast, obviously. I focused for this research on these three counties, Talbot, Caroline, and Dorchester County. Uh, this is where the birthplace of Frederick Douglass uh, and Dorchester for Harriet Tubman. Um, so these are obviously key places. These are some photographs of what these places look like today. Of course, there's a lot of photographs that I could offer. These are just interesting ones. 
Um, it's an interesting question about representing the past. I saw a presentation by Stephen Nelson recently at UCLA uh, on the Underground Railroad. Um, and he said one can never adequately represent the historical past. What can we see? What's the perception of the place? What's the vibration? What's the residue? When you see the place now, what does it offer you in terms of understanding the past? And this is a paraphrase of what he said, but I thought it was very perceptive. I think one could also say that about representing the present, but in terms of the Underground Railroad, particularly challenged because of the illicit nature of the Underground Railroad, the lack of documentation and actual stations of the Underground Railroad, who was involved, where was involved, and so on. And the fact is that the landscape that we see now is not the historical landscape. So for example, in Dorchester County, um, there is the, what's called now the Blackwater Wildlife Refuge, which is this large water area. And when I saw it, I thought, wow, well, this is a place of marginal lands, little you know, population. This could be a place, if someone was escaping from slavery, slavery in this area, they might come to this place as they're not going to run into other people or human development. There's refuge here. There's also danger and so on. But as I looked into it, I realized, well, this is what it looks like now. But even in 1985, if you look at the aerial imagery from 1985, you can see that the actual extent of that water area, that huge marsh, was much less in 1985. Who knows what it was like in 1850? And in fact, in the historical maps that I've seen, they don't even show a marsh in this area. So what we're looking at now is not the historical landscape. It's quite different. Um, and this is a photograph I took. This is along this road right here that you see um, in the 2020 image right here. It's just a huge marsh water cover. But it may not have been that in the 1840s and 50s and so on. So what do we do? Well. <clears throat> what I did was I looked for some historic maps that should show me what the landscape looked like back in uh, the mid 1800s. And I did find this map. This is a map of Maryland created by Simon Martinet. Much of the map was created by him and his crew, his survey crew, actually traveling these different roads. Um, it was uh, funded by the state of Maryland. Um, and it's available as a digital resource. So you can see it here. Now this map was published in 1865, um, but the data were collected you know, prior um, in I think 1860 is the date on the map. And I imagine you know, given the civil war is probably not wandering around with his crew so much that it was collected prior, this is pure speculation on my part in the 1850s or something like that, because it's going to take a long time to wander around and collect all these data. In 1866, there was an atlas published using the same map imagery, but with color overlays, and the counties were on separate pages. So this is a map of Dorchester County right here. This is Cambridge up here. You could see a close-up kind of, of the central part of Dorchester County right here. Um, this is the Chesapeake Bay over here. Um, and so on. Um, and you look closely, what you see are features that I think are important to the Underground Railroad. You see road networks here. You see post offices. You see churches. You see schools. Um, you see mills, steam mills, uh, sawmills. You see towns um, and so on. You see uh, landings, bridges, ferries. Um, and so on. And these are the historical features represented on this map that I want to capture digitally. And one thing that's on this map that is really helpful in the interpretation is this legend. So the legend indicates, for example, not only the locations of the mills, but what kinds of mills, a sawmill and versus another kind of mill, that tells you something. If there's a lot of sawmills in an area, it tells you there's forests there because they were lumbering. If there's you know, other kinds of mills you know, for agricultural products, it tells you that that's an area with a lot of agriculture in it. The fact that the map distinguishes not only that there was a church at this location, but that it was a Presbyterian church, a Lutheran church, or a, a, an African-American church 
um, those are labeled as well, or whether it was a meeting house, that is a Quaker uh, place of worship. Those are very important features towards understanding the environment of the Underground Railroad. So here's what I did. I took this map, which was digitized and made available by davidrumsey.com from their uh, website. It's not only digitized, but it's georeferenced, which means it's placed in a coordinate system that allows me to integrate it with other digital data. I then got a road centerline file. These are all the roads in Maryland for the modern times, for right now. And I downloaded it from the Maryland Department of Transportation. And then I put them on top of each other, what we call in GIS, registering the layers together. And you can see that you know the modern roads match, in many cases, the historical roads. So you know if you follow my mouse, you can clearly see this is the modern road in green, the modern road network in green right here, and the historical road in the map underneath just runs perfectly parallel to it. And you can see that for many of the roads, that's the case. My assumption here is that that's the same road. <laughs> it's pretty reasonable, I think. Uh, and that the road has not moved, you know, and may have moved a little bit, some interchanges and so on, but the location of the road is essentially the same as it was in 1860. And so what I want to establish is some sort of reliable, what we call geodetic control. Our ability to represent where things are on the surface of the earth today is much more accurate than our ability in 1860. Although, frankly, I think it's totally amazing the geographic accuracy of the locations of these roads in 1860, considering they didn't have planes and satellites, is absolutely astounding um, when you look at it. But nonetheless, obviously more accurate now. So instead of just digitizing the roads on the maps, on the historical map, I took the modern roads and just selected those that are represented on the historical map. And I use that as what we call in GIS a framework data set. This is my representation of where the historical roads were in a modern geodetic system that is far more accurate than the actual representation in the historic map. So I extracted not all the modern roads, but just those on the map. I painstakingly went through visually and selected them and put them in its own data layer so that I just had a representation of those historical roads. It's my framework data set because everything else I digitize, every other historical feature I digitize is going to be hooked onto that framework data layer, the modern road system of the historical uh, roads. And then what I did was I started looking at all those individual features, the schools, the um, churches, the different types of churches, the shops, the post office, landing bridges, ferries, different towns, um, the road intersections, and so on. And they, I put them in a point data layer. This is like a map of all these individual features. I called them points of interest. And so they have all these individual points like you see here in a table and they're attributed. So for instance, this point here that I digitized represents this church right here. It's a point feature. I have its location here. I hooked it onto this road right here as it's expressed in the historic map. I said the type is a church for that particular point feature and it's an African-American church. That's a descriptor of what kind of church it is. And I did that for all the different types of features that you see here. Um, a little bit of, you know, GIS nerd stuff here. I reprojected everything onto the Mar Maryland State Plane uh, coordinate reference system because this is a better representation visually of the direction, measurements of distances and directions um, and so on than you have in other reference systems because it's centered on uh, Maryland. And I have to tell you, I spent a huge amount of time doing manual editing to improve the accuracy of what I was doing. Um, you know, again, these are nerdy words here like pseudo nodes and topologic integrity. But the, the fact is that if you want a road network that actually represents how people travel, you have to make sure that the connectivity among the different road systems um, works. So, you, you know, like if a road dead ends at a river, but in the modern road system, there's a bridge there it connects in the modern road system. But back in 1850, 
the road just ended at the river and it didn't connect. So if you want to actually model how people are traveling on that road network, you have to maintain the integrity of the connectivity. In 1850, you couldn't just take a road across that river, even if the road network in the modern representation has, I had to manually go in there and kind of change that to make sure that that integrity was maintained in my historic representation. That's a lot of manual work. Um, hopefully I can find a student to do a lot of that stuff in the future, but I, it was kind of fun to do it myself. I created what I called a weighted risk surface. I just made the assumption that basically any place you were gonna, if you were an escaping, uh, if you were a person escaping slavery, uh, any contact with development um, or other people aside from um, other you know, uh, uh, African-Americans or in some cases Quaker settlements was basically a place of potential risk of recapture. Uh, I don't know how reasonable that is, frankly. I'm, I think there's a lot of subtleties and nuances in there, but this is just my first cut at this. Um, so basically for every church, mill, school, and so on, I put every thousand foot distance. I said uh, the risk, that's high risk right within a thousand feet. And as you get further away from that location, the risk um, lessens. Um, uh, every thousand feet, up to 5,000 feet. I figured if you're about a mile away from one of these features in a very rural landscape, the risk decays down to zero again. So it's sort of a distance decay function. You can think of it that way. High risk at the um, town, and as you get away from the town, your risk is going to decrease as a function of distance. I did the same thing with roads and road intersections using a slightly different threshold for these rankings. And then for major towns, I said, these are really, really risky. I multiplied the risk factor by five. Same thing with the post office, I multiplied the risk factor by three. And for a minor town, I multiplied the risk factor by two. The key here with the details, I'm happy to talk about it afterward, but the idea is that different features in the landscape represent different, different levels of risk. And as you move away distance-wise from these different features, the risk decays. And you can weight these different features to kind of capture the level of risk. Again, there's nothing special about five times, three times. I'm honestly, I'm just making this up. I don't know what it is exactly, but I think just trying to insert some you know, measure of different levels of risk is very important. And these, these weights and measures can be refined as you know, we learn more. And then I generated a hillshade model for visualization. And that's what you see, you know, those features are represented on the map on the left right here. So these are road intersections and the red dots and the different features that represent places of risk and the blue dots in the study area right here. And this is the resulting um, map I came up with. So it's almost like the risk surface is topography or an elevation surface we can visualize it like it's a terrain surface. And, you know, as though there's a sun in the sky looking down on a surface of risk. And I assign colors to the surface where the red colors indicate greater risk and the green colors indicate lesser risk. So it's sort of like, you know, in this area around Cambridge, which is a major town uh, with a courthouse in it and a post office. Um, in a town like Cambridge, which is right here, you have very high risk. And as you move away from Cambridge, you're going to get lesser risk. It's like a mountain peak of risk. And down here in the marshy areas here, you know, or the green areas, as you get closer to the water, there's very little human development. So the risk decays to basically zero down here. Inside the inset box, you can see a close up right here. This is Cambridge right here. And you can see sort of the disks. This is like every thousand feet, the risk decays right here. So you have a representation essentially uh, of the risk surface. You can imagine that someone escaping slavery is basically faced with this risk surface that is distributed across the landscape. And they are trying to navigate their way northwards towards safety through this landscape of risk. 
And dotted throughout this landscape of risk are individual features of protection and refuge. And the challenge for them would be to get to those little places of refuge dotted within this landscape of risk as they work their way northwards. This is sort of how I'm envisioning this in my mind. Overlaid on this, I have this road network in black. The road network itself, because it is a place where one could unintentionally run into someone else, that is in itself a place of danger. So that is in some sense, a network that one could use to travel and move northwards. Okay, thank so you. Technicians, and they're going to do, um, just turn it over as soon as you can. I have here just uh, the optimal array. example optimal order, of optimal someone array. starting. Uh, this okay. is just a random place in the landscape. Right. If they started okay, thank here you. and they tried to work their way north, they are presented with this landscape. These are African American church locations here and Quaker meeting house in the smaller dots. If you were presented with this landscape, this would be the route of travel you would take to get to each one of these locations of refuge while minimizing your exposure to the risk surface. So you could see you can avoid roads by going south, moving here along the marshy area. You've got to cross a road here somewhere or else you're going to end up in the water. You can avoid these high points, but you have to get into them somehow if you want to get to this African-American church location here. So again, this is just a hypothetical. These are, I mean, these are actual locations of African-American um, churches and Quaker meeting houses, but who knows what other places of refuge may be on this landscape. If you're limited to say some constraints, because you can only travel at night and you can't move quickly since you're not traveling over a road, we can conjecture where you might have to stay. Let's say you're limited to five miles. You're not gonna make it to this African-American church from this location in a night. You're gonna have to stop somewhere halfway through. So you might have to stop somewhere around here. You're unlikely to stop right in a red area that already represents high risk. So we can conjecture where places they might have stopped on their travels are. I realize as I'm getting to the end of my time and I don't want to encroach on other people's time. So I'll let you read this yourself. But I, I think, you know, the main point I want to make here is that this work is highly speculative. I don't know how meaningful it is, um, but I hope that our manifestation or materialization of these landscapes and risk and protection might help us better understand and connect with the actual experiences of people escaping slavery. Um, I read recent efforts on digitizing other aspects of slavery in the United States for historical research. And there was a great um, quote, this person said, we have to remember these are actual individual people and you know, escaping slavery, they had real experiences. And so, you know, trying to materialize those experiences through these digital representations that can be somewhat sterile and abstract is a challenge of this research. But that, you know, that is for me sort of the, the goal of this type um, of research. I think there's a really strong potential for connecting with public history. Uh, I'm just not sure you know, how to do that, and I'm, I'm open to any um, ideas that you might have. Um, I want to thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, I know we don't have much time, but I'm happy to answer any questions, and my contact information uh, by email is here. I, I'd be happy to hear from you. Dr. Menes, thank you so much. Uh, uh, words are not sufficient uh, to tell how happy we are uh, to hear your presentation. Um, I, will, I will give you a summary of your questions and I uh, honestly confirm every point you make and I think what you have done makes lots of sense and it hasn't been done before, but we have a question. Let me take those questions first. Again, uh, this was a wonderful presentation. The question comes from uh, 
Mr. Uh, Tanju, and it is any consideration given to traveling on a boat at night and how the prevailing currents may have helped. Uh, would you like to elaborate on that a little bit, Dr. Menes? Sure, that's, uh, that's a great question. And, um, you know, one I, I completely ignored in this research so far, obviously, is travel by water, which is kind of ironic considering the first thing I showed in the mural is Harriet Tubman beckoning uh, someone escaping to come with her on a boat. And, and certainly um, the waterways were obviously a main conduit of travel. Um, that's something I should do and I will do in the future. Um, it was just, you know, this is, I think this is, a, I think of what I've done so far as a prototype. Um, and by, by what I mean a prototype in the GIS world means a proof of concept uh, to see what is it possible and what kind of problems you might have. Um, obviously, including the waterways is a very important component of trying to understand um, the nature of travel and how one might, um, one might represent the, the danger. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because, you know, this is, this is the map right here. So the smaller waterways, like, Someone could travel in the waterways here, if you could see my mouse, uh, mouse right here, through some of these smaller waterways right here. Um, you know, one could travel through the marshy areas by boat, or, you know, if you were leaving uh, from an area here, you might take, you know, a boat and travel along the coastline here, up, up um, through some of the smaller channels here. You know, the Choptank River, this is, you know, if someone had a boat, fine, but you're not, you know, swimming across here. It's like two miles across, you know? So th there are some things in terms of the representation that need to be materialized. Like, can you swim across here? Do you need a boat? What are the currents, you know? Um, what are the tides, you know? When is this available? And, you know, th there's landings on either side. So, but you're taking a boat up here, it's wide enough. If you get in the middle of the channel of the chop tank up here, you probably won't be seen by anyone on the shoreline. But once you get up here, there's some ferry landings here uh, and, you know, and a bridge up here that you, know, you can't get away from being seen by someone in the shoreline. So, you know, there's some interesting representational um, details that I think really need to be captured. And, and that's an interesting challenge. So I, I think I need to think a lot more about and read, frankly, a lot more about that um, to try and represent that mode of travel, because it's obviously such an important one for this project. Thank you for the question. It was a powerful question. And thank you for the very elaborate uh, response from Dr. Menis. Other questions? Any other questions? I don't have questions for Dr. Menes' presentation. It was really an eye-opener uh, for me. Uh, I've been doing some research on Underground Railroad, as you can understand. Uh, uh, I was a PHC, a Pennsylvania Humanities Council speaker for several years in 1990s, and I traveled to these little towns and everywhere I went, uh, there were stories that were kept in their archives, in their little libraries, where they stored some documents. And they were very happy, the townspeople who invited me to speak, to show them to me. And there are deeds, there are maps that are used by people, and they have kept these in old boxes, which is really like um, an epic memory of American history, uh, which is nowadays uh, attempted to be erased. An example comes to me from Havre de Grace uh, that I visited several times and even yesterday. Uh, but here is the question to Dr. Manis. If the road <clears throat> has ended near a creek, uh, what do you do when you are trying to create these road maps? Will you continue uh, by speculation that the person may have swam uh, because they really wanted to walk in the creeks uh, rather than swim in order to make sure that they were not being followed by dogs of the kidnappers and bounty hunters. That's one question. The other one is risk surface. And I love this term that you came up with. 
what were the deceitful ways to avoid capture is something that we have to investigate more uh, because as you said, and you were very, very correct in saying there were immense risk areas. Uh, as you move away from the civilization, of course, it's safer, which you had mentioned. Uh, so these are some of the things that I would like to inquire more when we have time to speak about our future projects. Um, uh, any any remark, any response that you may have had in your mind, Dr. Manis, is welcome. And here, there's another question. Uh, <laughs> Uh, can you read the chat? Uh, oh, Jeff? yeah, sure. Sorry, I didn't bring it up. <laughs> any, any responses to any of the remarks? Anything you want to add? I think you said most of the things. And you are coming up with a new research, which has not been attempted before. It is incredibly difficult. But I encourage you, you have uh, accomplished a lot that not many people attempted to do because the the work is uh, tremendous uh, i am i'm very humbled with your research and i thank you for sharing with us anything to add dr menis um yeah thank you so much for the opportunity and your kind words i'll just very briefly um respond to your question the ability to represent reality and true human experience in a computer from a geographic perspective is from my, from my perspective, the ultimate question in geographic information science. That, that is the leading question for everything, not just for this project. So your question about, well, what about water? You know, like, can we get it? And, and the same question about, well, can't they travel by boat? What, they wanna walk in their creeks? Like, how do they, you know, how do they behave when they're trying to escape from people? Where do they go? You know, the ability to computationally represent that at a level of granularity that is useful to, for understanding is what we're trying to do. And, you know, that means a level of effort that is very high. So I didn't account for water travel and I had them basically avoid water cells because I had masked out the water from my landscape surface. So in my like root planning here, they're avoiding water when in reality, they're <laughs> trying to find water in many cases. So, and travel on the water. So, you know, what that means is that, you know, in this digital representation, we need to understand human behavior and their interaction with the landscape. And then we need to computationally represent that in a robust way. On the flip side, a one-to-one -one scale map of the world is impossible. So there's not reality in the, there's always a model. You're always just, you always have to remove some part of reality to represent it. Otherwise it's not a representation. So finding that sweet spot is, is the challenge we face. But that's not just true of this project. That's true of everything, <laughs> so. True. And the risk factor or the risk uh, surface that you mentioned, I believe, also includes those passengers on the Underground Railroad, rather than calling uh, these uh, people who dare to escape, uh, I call them passengers. I don't like the term fugitives because it has different connotations, whereas uh, passengers were really seeking their freedom and it was their rightful act, but of course under the dictates of those days and the laws, it was a crime. Uh, for instance, um, one of the passengers, uh, Helen Kraft, who pretended to be a man when she and her husband got on the train was pregnant. So she was carrying an immense risk. Uh, she was going to deliver a baby, and, uh, but she got dressed as a man and her husband was pretending to be her or his servant. They were going north to seek medical attention. So uh, that is another issue that not many people talk about. You know, what were the risk factors female or male uh, passengers took when they were not feeling well, while they were sick, they were aging. Um, like Harriet Tubman carried most of her relatives back to freedom, including her parents, as you mentioned, and I'm sure they were not 25 years old. So uh, what were the risks involved in walking more than four or five miles at night at cold, 
Harriet Tubman, as we heard, was uh, able to walk many miles and she was wearing uh, one or two extra coats uh, so that she would be protected from uh, the cold night air. These are, of course, are embedded into our uh, epic memory of American and African-American history. And we will look into these more in future. Uh, if there are no more questions, and I'm checking the chat, uh, I will then say one more time, thank you to Dr. Jeremy Menes of Geography and Urban Studies at Temple University. His presentation was equally uh, terrific as I can define, and it's gonna open new windows for us, something that we had been neglecting for many years when we study underground railroads. So you are going to be a prime examiner, uh, Jeremy. Thank you and congratulations. We look forward to reading your books about this topic and on this topic. Me too. <laughs> Thank you very much, much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, I will continue. And of course, if you need to, if anyone needs to step out, uh, and come back. I'm going to introduce our next speaker, uh, who is also coming to us from Temple University. Uh, her name is Miss Jasmine Clark. She is a Temple librarian. She's going to talk about digital methodologies for Black education how increased access to digital tools are changing the ways we teach. I would like to introduce Jasmine Clark to you. She is the digital scholarship librarian at our university. Her primary areas of research are accessibility and metadata in emerging technology and emerging technology centers. Currently, uh, Ms. Clark is leading the Virtual Bloxum, a project to recreate and gamify the Charles Bloxum Afro-American collection in virtual reality to teach high school students primary literacy skills. She is also doing research in 3D metadata and the development of Section 508 compliant guidelines for virtual reality experiences. She is also the chair of the DLF, Digital Accessibility Working Group, as well as a co-chair of the DLF Committee for Equity and Inclusion. I am very proud and happy to introduce Ms. Jasmine Clark to you about her uh, very interesting research and career uh, concerns. Welcome, Jasmine. Hi. Thank you. And well, uh, Dr. Nogan, actually, I'm an alum of the Africology department here. I've taken classes. Uh, yes, and I'm always very happy to be back and um, share I'm some. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. Please forgive me, oh, Jasmine. Oh, no, I'm actually here to just plug our department. <laughs> Thank you. And so, and so um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, but before I do that, what I'm going to do is um, there are going to be links to all of the projects I talk about and any data sets. So I'm gonna share my slides in advance if you wanna look at the notes um, and go ahead and follow along or open things and uh, access them as I talk about them. So here we go. All right, um, really quickly, I'm gonna turn on our captions. Perfect. So once again, hi, my name is Jasmine Clark. I am the Digital Scholarship and as of um, the end of last year, the Africology and African-American Studies Librarian as well um, due to the unfortunate loss of a very beloved colleague. Um, in her memory, I'm going to try to do this right. So um, the so I'm going to basically, for the sake of time, jump right into showing example projects that could be of interest. I'm going to cover a broad ground, um, a broad, broad kind of, a broad suite of methodologies that may overlap with some of the things others have talked about, 
but this is going to be more geared towards those. I'll also talk about resources for those who are already doing the work. So um, Dr. Menes talked about needing a graduate assistant. I'm going to talk about how maybe the libraries can help you out with that. So um, I'll introduce projects that for those of, um, of for those attendees who aren't familiar with these kinds of technologies. And then I'll also introduce resources and additional data points and things like that that may be of interest. I am a librarian. It's what I'm here to do. So. Um, the first thing I want to introduce is this project. Uh, the first methodology I'm going to introduce is augmented reality. Um, generally, virtual reality, augmented reality, and, and, and all of these other types of realities are classified under XR. Uh, augmented reality, if you're familiar with Pokemon Go, it's the concept of implanting or overlaying uh, virtual data onto the real world. I'll show a video in a moment. Virtual reality is creating an entire real world and also sometimes in caves. The caves are these giant rooms that have like 3D projections that you walk through. I personally don't like them, but um, Villanova has a large cave. And then XR can incorporate any of the other kinds of various things that you would um, access. So here we have Pen and Slavery, which is an AR gui uh, gui guided self tour. AR guided self tours are pretty popular. Um, and I'll play this video and you can talk about it a bit there. Hello and welcome to the Pen and Slavery Augmented Reality app. The original intention of this project was to spatially locate the university's role and complicity in the institution of slavery onto the current campus. Over the process of creating the app, we decided that this history of slavery, though wedded to the institution, shouldn't be bound to its campus. You can participate from wherever you are and learn about the student research which helped to shed light on this history. The tour has six stops, each of which tells a part of the history of Penn's deep relationship to slavery, the university's founding, its history as an academic institution, and the experience of marginalized Black and Indigenous lives. This app has given us the opportunity to creatively present, manifest, and reveal the university's legacy in an informative and engaging way. Download the app in the App Store and Google Play Store to learn the role slavery played in the foundation of the university and the country and join the conversation. So what I wanted to point out here, this is an example of what I mean by um, over mapping a virtual object or um, scene onto the real world. So via your phone, you would, and the, I'll talk more about the relevant like, kind of theories of embodiment and why this matters. But what you're seeing here is they've mapped a door, a digital door, um, recreating an original scene onto a physical scene of the courtyard, um, which is what AR is. Hello and welcome to the pen. So the next thing I want to talk about uh, following Dr. Menace would be mapping GIS. Uh, this is a project called the Underground Railroad in Beacon Hill, Beacon Hill being a neighborhood in Boston. Um, this project is obviously like a multimedia project, but was created using as a uh, story maps from Esri. Um, and it shows um, known hiding places, residents, and community locations aff affiliated with, associated with the Underground Railroad. You can filter out this map and look at locations. But it also introduces, as Dr. Um, as Dr. Nogun just mentioned, uh, Ellen and William Kraft, <laughs> the couple who the, for, during which the wife uh, posed as a man. A white man to get them north. Um, other relevant locations and other relevant data that's just really easy to access. Uh, these types of maps pull, oftentimes a lot of these projects pull from like National Park Service data. Uh, I don't know how familiar everyone is. I'll actually drop a link into the chat uh, at some point. Or actually, I can do that now. Um, but the National Park Service data, uh, National Park Service, here we go, as a result of the National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom Act of 1998 created this huge thing um, you can apply to basically preserve and provide access to both local and federal data around um, the fight against slavery. Um, and so a lot of projects pull from their various data sets and points. Um, and this project did that as well. They pulled from the NPS data. Letting me one moment. Oh, let's go back. It uh, delayed and then took me back. Okay. Um, 
Perfect. Optical character recognition, OCRing. Um, here I'm introducing the project Chronicling America. Uh, OCR is basically an AI algorithm that recognizes text. Uh, traditionally, it recognizes, recognized print text, but there have been innovations. Abby Feinreiter, for example, has developed uh, an algorithm that recognizes handwritten manuscripts as well. Um, obviously, it depends on the quality of handwriting. Uh, but this project in particular is an example of a giant project that uses OCR. This is the Chronicling America project, which is a partnership between the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Library of Congress. Uh, a number of institutions, organizations, archives, universities have uploaded and shared uh, original newspapers from the time period, uh, dating from the 16, from 1690 into the present. Uh, you can just search. So the thing is, traditionally, you would scan these newspapers and then you would have to manually search through all of them to see if it had anything relevant to you, right? With OCR, you can now, these are searchable. So what you'll see is I just did a quick search for Underground Railroad. I selected the very first option available. And you'll see, first of all, there are 9,614 results for Underground Railroad alone. Uh, then I selected the very first result and you'll see the first thing that pops up is an article talking about 26 slaves in one week. This person is uh, very concerned. They say, um, don't know what the end of the week will foot up. All went by the Underground Railroad. And they said that this is a recurring thing that has happened. There have been groups, large groups of enslaved people passing through, and I believe this is Vermont, passing through <laughs> Vermont. And it's, these are white witness, white people watching this and just going, oh, look at all these black people just passing through the state via the Underground Railroad. And so what this is allowing us to do now is say, and you'll notice OCR isn't perfect, but even though it didn't capture railroad, it did capture underground. So it still pulled information that I needed. Um, this project is really useful if you want primary sources or a better understanding of the routes that people took because you have newspapers from around the country chronicling this. You also get a lot of political views. There are a lot of articles, very anti Underground Railroad, very pro. <laughs> um, and this is another, once again, the kind of value of OCR being available more broadly and commercially. You have network mapping, map, mapping and visualization. Um, this, just for the sake of being clear on what this is, I chose examples that don't have to do with the Underground Railroad. But if you look, if you go into my slides and look in the notes, I've hyperlinked to a um, dissertation from a Temple University student um, that uses the same technology for a more related purpose. But what I want to do is just introduce this more broadly: network mapping and visualization. Um, you'll see on the left. There is a network cloud and the circles are called nodes. The lines connecting them are called edges. The nodes represent individual entities. So people, locations, specific data points, and then the lines show the relationships between them. Um, and what you'll see is there are times where the cloud gets denser. So there'll be groupings of nodes indicating a high level of relation based on however you filter them. So these all are people in the same location or people from the same background or people who speak the same language. Um, and to the right, you'll see an example of a data set. This is a fellow who worked, uh, or a faculty member who was doing research within our center. I'll talk about our center later. Um, and you have these labels, which are the, represent the nodes. Um, so these are individual people. This project was looking at the people who colonized New Sweden. So these are Swedes coming from Sweden, colonizing Sweden, New Sweden. So these are families or individuals representing the heads of families, the years they arrived, and other data points that can, then can be used to filter. Um, one thing I've always been interested in, but had it will have to be on the burner for a while, is using this kind of technology for Black genealogical, uh, genealogical research. The idea that, um, so when you do Black genealogical research, if your ancestors were enslaved, it can be very difficult to determine. Um, for example, if my family started in North Carolina, and then um, after being freed, moved um, into Mississippi, into other parts of the South. One of the ways that you can figure out if it's the same person, if Sam, Negro 26, <laughs> that's all the data you have is the same, um, is by their relationships. They oftentimes moved in groups or with biological or selected kin. So something like this could be very useful in kind of looking at the ways that um, kin and relationships determined, um, determined migration as well as just identifying people. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is textual analysis. This is a project uh, from the from Brown University. They created a guide to kind of give you a tutorial on how to do this. Uh, this is using Voyant, which is an open source option. Um, and first things first, what I'm going to do is introduce the collection to the left. 
Uh, this is the North American Slave Narratives collection from the, um, do, from the Documenting the South Project at the University of North Carolina. This is a large corpus of first person narratives um, related and um, related to enslaved people finding freedom. Um, you can, and you'll see I've highlighted, you can actually download the full text of this collection for analysis. Um, and then what you'll see they've done is they've taken a full text, and by that I mean they've taken, used, an o, used OCR or hand transcribed things, they've taken the texts of these narratives, made them re machine readable, like I showed you in the Chronicling America example, and then uploaded them into the software called Voyant. And what Voyant does is uses AI and a number of algorithms and other things to create word clouds. So what you're seeing to the right is um, a word cloud here is the frequency of terms. So man appears frequently, time appears frequently in this corpus, uh, people. And what you can then do is filter out stop terms. So you don't want and, the, any other prepositions. Uh, and then also other things. So fre word frequency over here, you can see the frequency with which words appear relative. So you'll see people is very high. It's this people is blue, this very high peak. Um, and also word correlations will show you what words tend to appear next to each other very often. Um, you do use this kind of software. There are very expensive paid options that are typically used for industry to, uh, to analyze like social media and things like that uh, in terms of the business world. But what you um, can then do is this, these things called topic modeling or, or sentiment analysis, topic modeling, trying to gauge the topic, key topics and things that come up and sentiment analysis, trying to gauge the tones. So if people are talking about freedom, what are the sentiments around the discussion of freedom in these narratives, for example? And then, of course, there are traditional virtual exhibits and multimedia interactive projects. Um, this is the Colored Conventions Project hosted out of Penn, uh, the Penn State. Um, and these are a list of exhibits from them. Um, I've also highlighted the, so similar to the Penn and Slavery AR project, Princeton, Georgetown, and I'm forgetting the other ones. Um, a number of other universities have done similar projects and they have created multimedia exhibits. Um, the link I sent you to the Underground Railroad uh, data from NPS also contains uh, virtual Underground Railroad tours where you can, and it's more in exhibit form. Um, a lot of these projects are made using Omeka. That's really popular and we host it here at Temple as well. Um, and of course these can, include your maps and other things as well. So um, your AR links and all the other, let's say you've create, done some mixture of all of these methodologies I've introduced, you can then combine them together into some form of um, kind of cohesive exhibit for people to access virtually. There are other technologies, but I'm trying to keep to the ones that, are, that have become accessible and are less expensive and are open source. So let's talk about how these are actually being applied to um, teaching. come back. So there are curricula. This is the Freedom on the Move project. Uh, it is a project that accepts submissions from a number of institutions um, of slave ads. So runaway slave ads uh, that then allows them to create a database tracking people and kind of keeping. So if you've ever read these ads, they actually include a lot more data than your general census would. Uh, she has rough hands, it's five foot three, you know, what types of things she wears, how she talks. There, I've seen um, ads that say, you know, she puts on airs, um, which is a lot more than we know about enslaved individual lives, right? These people. And so this um, project creates this database where you can search by who they ran away from, what location, age, number of resources. So if you know that you have an ancestor or you're looking for someone who did flee and you want more information on them, this project is useful. In addition, this project has a K through 12 for teachers, which includes like ways to actually integrate this into the way you're teaching. So does the Color People Color Conventions Project. And a number of these projects actually do provide teaching guides and curricula guides uh, for people looking to integrate this at various levels of education. And of course, you can always take something K through 12 and up it a little bit for your own uh, work. Sorry, I'm having some lag time here. There we go, go back. Um, so, perfect. Next, I wanna talk about gamification. This is a board game, an underground railroad board game, but you can, the, the kind of gamification goes digital and like you can, <laughs> game theory applies to both video games and traditional games, so I'm gonna count this. Uh, the underground railroad board game is one, uh, is a collaborative game. So collaborative meaning that no one person can win. You all have to win together. 
Uh, but also the goal is to end is to end slavery in the United States. Uh, you have cards, so you have uh, conductors, priests, um, and a number of other subjects like types of players. And then you um, are supposed to the goal of the game is to get enslaved people from their plantations in the South up to Canada, uh, while also fundraising, raising funds and awareness and pushing back against enslavement. The value of this from a historical standpoint is also the as you can see to the right, uh, there are cards that are that reference specific events and they kind of tell you the time period in which they took place and kind of show you the trend of events. So you have Levi Coffin, the Amistad Rebellion, Elijah P. Lovejoy, and a number of other historical figures that players then use to further the game. Um, so this is just a good way. Gamification is generally a good approach to making education fun, repetitive, engaging in a different way. Um, and it is definitely something we at the center, and I'll talk about that once again a bit more, are specialized in. The head of our center is a game, produces board games himself and does game theory, as does our tech person. Um, and I'm building a video game. So this seems to be something very relevant to, <laughs> to us here at Temple University. So XR, obviously I'm invested in XR, I'm building a VR game, but um, before I go any further, I'm gonna go ahead and watch, introduce this video um, and then get into some of the stuff I've written, but this is the I Am A Man project, which recreates the sanitary uh, strikes and um, builds up to the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, so. I have some very sad news for all of you. One moment. And that is that Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight. I'm not One second. This VR experience transports you to Memphis during the civil rights movement. It's called I Am A Man, and it's developed by NC State University Assistant Professor Dr. Derek Hamm. Okay, I'm gonna re-push this back a little bit so this goes through. I was trying to do full screen, it did not cooperate. Give me one moment. Once everything stops freezing. The experience involves a series of short vignettes set during the 1968 sanitation worker strike. The Memphis sanitation force at the time was mostly black and given the lowest paying jobs and were refused equal workers rights. The VR experience gets its name from the iconic signs that protesters held in the streets. I am a man was a slogan that was used um, and actually printed out on protest signs of these sanitation workers in Memphis who were protesting wanting better pay, wanting equal rights on the job force. And that was the thing that brought Dr. King in the first place um, to support these men right before, of course, um, the tragic end of his life and the assassination of the Lorraine Motel. Sometimes, you know, you would get threats, you know, go back to work, this kind of thing. Because it's all the same thing, you know. They were saying I was black was illegal, and, but all they were saying, civil, uh, uh, segregation and, and, and this kind of thing, it all it means that a man is not a man. Those simple words, right? still made people very upset. You have to kind of take a step back and wonder and even be reflective about even Black Lives Matter. They can call horrible names, all these thugs and these people and this, and like really, all they're really saying is Black Lives Matter. They're not saying your life doesn't matter. And you look back at I am a man, and there were still people who pushed against these workers and were angry. You know, that shows that there's something that's seriously wrong um, with America still. The VR experience also lets you witness those protests up close. The experience is narrated using actual recordings of one of the sanitation workers, Taylor Rogers. Well, they didn't have any white sanitation workers. They dealt with the bulldozers, you know, they claimed things. I'm thinking about today, 2018, how much of it is would still work today. You know, a bunch of men coming together saying, we care about something and we're going to take action. I want to take a knee during the anthem. Oh, it's outrage. It's crazy. Any protest is going to disrupt people. They're going to make um, a group of people upset. So at a certain point, you just have to keep plowing. You have to keep um, letting your voices be heard. And you have to keep creating content to retell their stories and to empower next generations. The 15 minute experience also features archival footage and photos that the players can interact with up close. But it'd be great for the person, a non-Black VR um, user to look and realize they're talking about me. I think that's a game changer. Instead of it just always being about, oh, they're talking about someone else. 
Well, it's just not the things we're used to down here. I mean, they come in and they sit down, and we're not used to them sitting down beside us because I wasn't raised with them. I want to basically pull you into a mind trap of having hands, African American hands, if you're non black, that starts to temporarily disrupt your perception about the world. Even when I've seen testers who are black and testers who aren't black, some of the ones who are black took for granted that they had black hands. They're like, oh yeah, it's no big deal. And like, you know, it's interesting if you're non-black and you try that on, your mind has, has flipped over. In a, in a similar way, when I try a VR experience and I have white hands, I've tried several and it's like, oh man, I have these white dudes hands, okay. The sanitation worker strike also attracted Martin Luther King Jr. to Memphis to help organize meetings and protests. It's also where he would be assassinated, on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel, where the experience takes you moments before it happened. This was new for me, dealing with a story like this. Um, my first iterations of it, which no one will ever see, actually allowed you to see the entire moment. And what happened for me as a developer, it was messing my mind up a little bit. I've obviously shifted away from explicitly letting you see it. I'm frankly not sure if we're ready to see certain things that have happened in our history. And you start to wonder, is VR ready to be that explicit? I think it might in someday in the future. But remember, I'm thinking about the majority of the people who will try my experience, a lot of them, they'll still be newbies. And then it was the shock that I began to focus on, that, that using that spatial audio to like give you that jarring effect, even in the, in the blackness of the scene where it fades out. VR experience also grants the viewer access to the inside of Dr. King's hotel room that gives you a look inside what is normally preserved behind a glass barrier in real life. I dare ask, could we re- Okay, so I'm gonna kind of stop here. Um, but I wanna say that was actually a fully, uh, a lot of en good entry points into, um, I'm just checking the chat. Uh, really quick, I'll just answer this. The gamification is a board game. Um, that is geared towards, I think, it's a pretty simple game. So I, you could easily do it with like an elementary school student if you wanted to. Um, we, I've played it here in the space. We have it at Temple University if you want to borrow it. Uh, we, we can't lend it outside of the space, but if you want to bring people to the space to play it in, our, in the library, you're free to do so. Um, I'll come back to this. Uh, so this hit on a couple of points. I actually laughed. So when I first started working at Temple University and I got into a headset, nobody warned me that I re requested a specialized experience that focused on uh, creating virtual classroom. And it was from Ireland and the hands were white. And uh, I was traumatized. <laughs> uh, I looked down and had, but I, I remember I distinctly said, my hands are pink and <laughs> took the, head, the headset off immediately. I was like, whoa, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, because, and it's an interesting research that kind of, kind of question of, and this is where we get theories of embodiment, right? Well, one, um, we talk about all the time, black people automatically think about race. This is something that we are kind of very aware of, but whiteness is considered a default. So may not be super conscious of that. So for me, it was a very specific reaction as someone who identified very heavily as black, who would always really was very conscious of that. If you think about the Negrescence model or Du Bois talking about his becoming aware, this idea that like I had before had to become aware of that early on. What is that? And he talks about this. What is this? What does embodiment mean for someone who's non-racialized to suddenly become racialized? Right. Um, so that's embodiment. Empathy is of course talking about like you know how does this change your uh, the ability to understand or empathize with whatever subject is being covered in this experience and also recontextualization. So um, let's go back to that AR experience I talked about. It's very different going into a museum or into an archive and seeing the cornerstone of a building or seeing photos of a space versus have going to the physical space and actually having the objects placed there and actually contextualizing those objects uh, in, in, in that appropriate, it's original space, right? And when we talk about, um, I'd actually have thought about this. I was talking about this with someone. There was a video game developer talking about developing an experience that recreates uh, crossing the, the Mexican border, the, so crossing the desert uh, as an immigrant or as a refugee. Uh, and there, I, the person talking about it, I was like, let's pause, don't do that. But, <laughs> but the idea of doing this for something like the Underground Railroad, which is important because you're talking, we talk about you know, fleeing from freedom it, to freedom, it's already very much, you know, a loaded topic. But what happens when you show people 
it was dark. <laughs> you know, this, this wasn't a modern landscape. There were no city lines. The North Star, you had to identify the North Star. What happens when you're traveling at night? It is dark. You're looking around. You're scared. You're hearing sounds. You're avoiding. How does that change the way a student understands what, what going for freedom, what the, the bravery required to go for freedom meant, right? If you do something like this, how does that change your understanding as someone who's trying to understand Harriet Tubman? Like, not only to do it once, but you did it multiple times. <laughs> You did it hundreds of times. You went back and forth. You hear dogs chasing after you. You're crossing lakes. You're looking at the, you're, it's dark. It's, you're, there's all of these things, right? What is it? You encounter an initial cabin and you don't know anything, you know, for someone who's done this multiple times, but you're, these are now strangers who are welcoming you into a hidden room and you're hiding there. So VR is a very interesting from that standpoint, one done ethically and correctly. And as you know, I've talked about this longer, VR is my research area, so I'm a little biased, but I, I do think that it has obvious applications in terms of the classroom and pedagogical value. Um, The multiple, so I really quickly want to introduce multidisciplinary projects and spaces, so the, um, in digital research spaces. So many universities, including our own, have labs, centers, that and workshops, and these labs and centers oftentimes host these workshops to support digital research. They also usually produce projects. Um, and examples include Stanford's Literary Lab, which is literature focused, the University of Pennsylvania's Price Lab for Digital Humanities, it leans literature focused because the head of it is from the English department, but it technically does other things like GIS and gaming as well. I don't know as much gaming, but GIS and a couple of other methodologies. Uh, Penn State's Center for Black Digital Research is the Colored Conventions Project. Uh, and Harvard's Meta Lab does a lot of really interesting, they have a relocation project where they uh, created a user-friendly uh, GIS centered that use census data uh, project that shows you you can filter out the qualities that you are looking for and it shows you where most people are moving to for those qualities. So um, once again, if you have access to these slides, please go ahead. I mean, uh, link and look around and poke around for these projects, but these spaces and centers, I'm going to talk about our own shortly here at Temple, uh, offer a lot of resources. So let's talk about what we have here at Temple. Uh, where I work. The Loretta C. Duckworth Scholar Studio is on the third floor of Charles Library. If you're coming up the steps, you turn left and we're that whole side of the floor. If you come up the elevator, you go straight right to that whole side of the floor. Um, and as you can see, we have tables, game spaces. This is where we play video games. We actually do board games every week when we're in, we're not currently back in the building, all of us, but when we are once a week, we play board games and we you'll see us at one of these tables and anybody's free to join us uh, if you're interested in getting into gaming and things like that. Uh, we have a VR room. You'll see that we have, uh, it holds about 10 people, but we do class tours here. Uh, so we'll, the tape on the floor is because a lot of modern headsets now have, they'll project a virtual kind of wall. So to prevent you from running off into the, you know, to the distance. Uh, but we also have computers, different types of headsets. Back here, this thing that looks like a baby bouncer is an omnidirectional treadmill. It just allows you to slide your feet so you get the sensation of walking. Um, and this projection screen, I do a lot of K through 12 tours. And one thing that um, is really popular, so not everybody can use VR, obviously, you have uh, people who wear turbans and the headsets aren't great, or people who just don't like the sensation, get vertigo, whatever, for whatever reason, having a projection screen means that they can see what the person in the headset is doing. And with K through 12, you see it really well, they, um, it's quite enjoyable for them, they love to be like, to your left, to your left, jump. Job. And they're like all the whole class is getting very involved. The person in the headset is like very much just like into it. They're like, everybody's rooting for me. I got to go hard. It's very funny to watch. Um, this room is entirely soundproofed. So they're not disturbing anybody. Um, so this is a room that we host as well. Uh, we have a maker space. Uh, so when you talk about taking the 3D into tactile, so if you make a 3D model, you can 3D print it. Uh, you can also laser cut and do which laser cutting does engraving as well as full cutting. Um, Arduino work is single board, single board computing. So for example, if you wanna make a smart mirror, if you've ever seen those mirrors that connect to your phone, they're using like a Raspberry Pi. You can make one yourself pretty easily if you know like very basic programming. Um, so that's Arduino or single board computing work. Uh, uh, and we have a makerspace grant. So if you're someone who's really interested in using any of this technology for your classes, you can apply and it pays for your uh, materials as well as our makerspace manager will help you your class onboard and train to use all of this technology yourself for your coursework. Um, in addition, more broadly, um, 
so before that, uh, we have other resources. We do offer high processing computers. So those computers in our space are different. You will walk into our space at any time and see students gaming <laughs> on the computers because that's what they're designed for. Uh, we have various software that includes things like Agisoft. So if you want to do uh, 3D stuff and you want to do photogrammetry, um, if you we have uh, 360 degree cameras. We had someone from criminology who did a project where they did 360 videos so they could examine broken windows and uh, like things that associated with crime. Uh, DSLR cameras and tripods. We have Nintendo Switches and games. We play those sometimes in the space. Um, and we actually had an art history professor come in and have their students play Assassin's Creed because uh, the architectural things are so accurate and whatever as an art history made person, it's very valuable. Uh, and board games. So this Be Lives game you see here on, the, here on the second shelf is actually one built, designed by and, and published by our space head. So if you're interested in game theory, we're, we're really, we're unique in that that is something we're very actually invested in as compared to other centers who don't have as much in terms of gaming knowledge. Um, we also offer a faculty fellowship program. So people, faculty members can apply and you'll get access to a grad student to assist you with your work and research time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We also, uh, if you're interested in that, I'll have my email at the end, but please uh, feel free to reach out if you have questions. Um, we offer workshops. This is important. These are free and open to everyone, not just faculty. They're open to the public as well. And we've covered topics like web scraping, YouTube. So taking uh, basic, doing basic programming, pulling all the text out from the comments of a YouTube page and then doing analysis on that. Uh, coding, 3D modeling, game development, accessible project design. I do a lot of accessibility work. I'm our section 508 person, meaning uh, accessibility for disability. I also help you develop alternative access plans for your classes. So if you're like, I'm using a technology that's not accessible, how can I make it so that if a student with a disability comes in, we can make this work? I'm here for you. Uh, our Python and text mining and more. Um, you can find us at library.temple.edu backslash events. It's all hyperlinked in the slides um, to see what we're offering. Um, and he's just a list of other, this is just because you have access to the slides. These are other lists of projects. This top one is just a list of Black DH projects that you may want to access and use for your classes. Uh, this is a journal of interactive, te interactive technology and pedagogy. If you want like hard research on the implementation and efficacy of these pedagogical tools, there you go. Um, I'm published in there. <laughs> so big plug. Um, digital collections and databases. And uh, this is just a list of projects that could be of interest to you that incorporate some largely from the antebellum, um, Civil War era reconstruction and antebellum era. Uh, there's a list of African-American studies organizations and researchers and institutes. Some of these don't explicitly label themselves as digital centers, but do that work. Rupika Risam does a lot of research on colonial decolonializing and like digital methods, DH, low power computing for in the Caribbean and for places with low infrastructure. Um, and then the Hathi Trust Research Center has tools that allow you to kind of play around and, and do um, analysis on their collections because they have a lot of digitized primary sources that may be of interest to you all. If you have questions, this is where I can be reached. I'm jasmine.l.clark at temple.edu. I will, I'm, I hope I didn't run over. I apologize. I will also check the chat. <laughs> oh, Jasmine, thank you so much. This was another marvelous presentation on our conference, and we appreciate your efforts and your presentation. No, you did not run over time. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was trying to tell you to slow down because uh, the material you are introducing needs to be absorbed. And we did most of it. And the parts I missed, I will come and have a chat with you. So I will learn more. <laughs> As an African-American and Africology major, you have proved a stellar student and a librarian. I am very proud and humbled uh, listening to your research. That's so beautiful. We appreciate everything you presented to us. Uh, now, let's see if there are any questions. Uh, I have a couple of remarks and not questions, but remarks. Uh, let's look at the chat. Jasmine, is, do you see any? So the board game link is found under the um, under gamification, if you're looking for the link to that game to purchase. Um, I hope that answers your question. And once again, I do recommend um, Introducing board games into classrooms is actually pretty well established. I, can, I, please reach out and email me. I'm sure we can find some articles or whatever to send you if you need, if you would like to um, have some studies on that. 
but um, they there are a lot of known benefits to gamifying your research. <laughs> um, uh, monopoly is te technically that's what monopoly was designed for. It was meant to be a, a critique on capitalism, how successful that is. There's game, there's research and stuff on that, but that's what monopoly was designed for. So if you think about it, there's like a lot of there are a lot of applications and a lot of examples for gamifying uh, whatever topic you'd like to discuss. Um, any other questions that or comments? I'm open. I'm sorry. Uh, are there any questions, any remarks? I have one to open the floor for conversation and at the same time prepare our audience for the very exciting panel coming up. Meanwhile, I want to greet uh, my colleagues, Dr. Dove, welcome, I see you. Thank you for attending. I see our students, my students, some of your students as well. Thank you, our students, for listening to Ms. Clark's presentation and being here even for the previous presenters. I think today marks a high point in Underground Railroad Conference, the 19th year. It's getting better every year. So next year, uh, 20th year, we will have a major celebration and hopefully it will be face-to-face. -face. So I greet uh, my colleagues. I thank our department and also I congratulate our stellar um, graduates like Ms. Clark. Uh, we have a booklet in our department and it says, what can you do with this degree? So I would direct everybody to Ms. Clark and say, this is what you can do. This is what you can be. Uh, she's just one of our majors who has these highest credentials and knows everything about technology. Jasmine, I have a question. And this is, as I said, and then there are other questions coming up. So after you respond to this one, please uh, look at the chat box and respond as much as possible. Uh, if uh, in these games that are being created around and about Underground Railroad history, if there are any problems, like if the truth is not being told correctly, or if there are distortions, or if it is not presented from African-American perspective, uh, what are the precautions, steps that we can take as researchers? What do you suggest and recommend? Um, actually, that's my primary area of research is ethics in a lot of these things. Um, so one thing that I, I think a lot of, and this is a result of lack of resources sometimes, um, oftentimes many, projects of scholars have one very distinct area of expertise and can't copy, can't necessarily compensate. So they're like, I'm really good at development or I'm really familiar with like this specific aspect of black history, but I'm not necessarily fully prepared for the broader ethical. So the, the example I gave of the person who wanted to recreate uh, crossing the border to kind of build empathy for refugees. Um, great developer um has developed horror games horror games where you're being chased and so the idea of, that's where they got the idea the idea of being like you know <laughs> terrified all the time but no firsthand experience with migrants no firsthand experience with understanding you know how do you even communicate um why you would leave in the first place why go through this terrifying experience well then you would have to get into what do my what are people experiencing in their home countries right what 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 are, what are they seeking refuge from um, and so one thing that it helps to do is one, set up a consultation with someone who specializes in those areas, talk to somebody, talk to, make sure it's one, your, your area of research. If you're going to publish on it, make sure that you're applying the same ethics for publishing and researching that you are to building a game. Um, there are really great examples. The, there is a project, I don't know, it's in, uh, British, British Columbia, it's in Canada. They are, um, they had a reconcili reconciliation. Um, they took a lot of kids and put them into foster care. And a lot of those kids fell prey to sexual abuse and a number of other abuses. Uh, and they worked with the children from that system and created a VR game that recreated their narratives. So what they did is they didn't make up the story themselves. 
they worked with the people who already had those stories and then kept those people on as advisors throughout the entire project, through the grant writing process. Um, the process is actually a reconciliation project for the Canadian school system. So the, this will be integrated into classrooms. Um, and they kept them on through that entire process. So what you do is you enter the headset, you listen, you actually meet the people. So they do a 360 video first and the people use, they show these adult, they're now adults, but former children who are in this kind of hellhole, to be honest, um, we're being frank, um, driving up, talking, hugging each other, showing the human, like these are people, and then they start talking and narrating and you listen to each of their stories and you can go, you can select a storyline that is associated with each person. And then you listen to their story and they recreate it. Um, and some of these stories are horrific and some of them are just day to day. Like they'll say, you know, we had one bathtub for all of the kids all day and we were playing in the mud all day. So the water, the earlier, the later you bathe, the murkier and muddier the water got just over and over again. And they show the water over time getting darker and darker and you're just watching this. And it's meant to just, so when you're getting into sensitive topics, the first thing is agency and, to, and ensuring the agency of the people you're talking about and whose stories you're talking about, but always go back to them, show them what you're developing, they show them how it's, make sure that it's accurate to them, make sure that they're thinking it through. Even with the um, example of I am a man, he talks about it. He's like, I initially showed him being shot and I realized I was getting messed up, <laughs> you know, user testing. He was like, I couldn't, I couldn't keep that in there. That's too much for me. And um, it is really important that we uh, approach these subjects with the appropriate reverence that they deserve. So consult, I'm in ethics, I do, that's my area. I, do, I write, <laughs> people consult with me all the time. So if you if you ever, I mean, for anyone here, <laughs> self-plug, I guess, um, I'm good for that. Um, but also talking to the people that you're working with, so. Hope you're muted, sorry. I am sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Jasmine, thank you for that explanation. Uh, a part of that question still remains on, answered. You did a good job, but here is my question. If the game is already out there, or is the if the narrative is out there, just like the geo-narrative that uh, Dr. Menes was talking about, how can we correct? There must be a, a quality check before these things air, you know? How do we take care of that? Because as you said, agency is of primary importance for us when we are telling the story of underground railroad passengers or fighters, uh, those people who, who are like Frederick Douglass, uh, Dr. King. Uh, of course, I see no uh, separation. Uh, Dr. King, Malcolm X, they are all freedom fighters and they are carrying, they were carrying the torch that was lit by the heroes and heroines of Underground Railroad for freedom. Uh, but how can we control this? Uh, if it gets out of control, like if they say something pejorative about Douglas or Harriet Tubman in the game, or if they are deceiving people about the nature of this important narrative, which we call a part of American epic memory, what do we do? Or how can we create this kind of quality check before it goes viral um there's a few routes routes the first is contacting the developer of the game um they can usually make amendments um if we are doing it in good faith unfortunately the game industry is very heavily white and very heavily male so if they did this for profit <laughs> you know they may not be good faith developers for something like this most times there are scholars or people who are doing this in good faith so usually if you reach out you can get a good result um, the other thing a lot of people do, so there is a, sometimes it's, it's, there's not a clean, this is good or bad, but like this requires a bit of analysis. Sometimes it's very hairy. You know, he talks about it. Would it have been wrong for him to depict the assassination of Dr. King? It's not necessarily a right or wrong, but as he said, it, it's about who your audience is and maybe it'd be too much and maybe it wouldn't be. There's, it's, it's complicated. It's complicated. It's con there's a lot of context that goes into that. And with that, that's where curricula, putting out curricula and associated documentation is important so that faculty, like teachers, educators know what they're getting into, can kind of gauge it for themselves, can do a more critical studies. There's a, a 360 domestic violence project where they do 360 videos depicting domestic, uh, the signs of domestic violence and de domestic violence scenes. And you, that's, you could say, you know, in the wrong hands, that can be exploitative. Sometimes it's not the game itself. It's, <laughs> you know, how you use it. Yeah. Um, the other option uh, is 
and I would I would say those are probably your your big ones. Um, if it's just incorrect, it, it there's not much you can do if the developers already put it out there. Um, I, I would say that trying, if you hear about these projects, try to catch it early, try to do reviews, try to get involved. I reviewed the project for Canada. That part, that's why I know about it. I was a reviewer for it um, because it is important to try to like <laughs> catch it before it gets out there and misinformation is spread. All right. Thank you so much. One more time we celebrate and thank you Jasmine Clark for her presentation to us. Uh, we appreciate and we have learned from you, Jasmine. We wish you all the best and we will continue to be in touch. <laughs> Thank you. We are planning to move to our panel uh, seamlessly. And here we are. Uh, I'm going to present our panel chair. Um, Dr. Richard Bell uh, will not be able to join us. Uh, he had prior commitments. So our panel is composed of, uh, under the panel chair, supervision of uh, Timothy Welbeck, uh, whom I'm going to read his bio. We will have Dr. Menis <clears throat> and Jasmine Clark. And of course, we will have Dr. Woski to join us if he can. Uh, we will create a panel for the sake of understanding what our options are to advance the Underground Railroad and Civil War and Black history research further. Uh, my question to the panelists will be, would you like to speak about what more you would like to do and add to advance and develop this topic? And how will your research contribute to our efforts? Uh, if there are no more questions about our panel uh, and how we will proceed, if you need to take a quick break, please go and come back. Um, I will introduce uh, Mr. Timothy Welbeck. Um, he is, um, and I'm very honored to introduce uh, Timothy Welbeck to you. Uh, Timothy Welbeck is the incoming chair of our very prestigious anti-racism center at Temple University. Uh, we are very proud to have him because he is a distinguished teacher and an individual and an attorney. Uh, Timothy Welbeck is an assistant professor of instruction in the Department of Africology and African American Studies at Temple University. A civil rights attorney by training Timothy is a scholar, scholar of law, race, and cultural studies. He earned his JD from Villanova University, Charles Widger School of Law, and his BA from Morehouse College. As I mentioned before, we are very excited about his position and the center. He is the incoming chair of the Anti-Racism Center at Temple University. He has several publications, uh, his scholarly work focuses on contemporary issues of racial identity in America, the intersection of racial classifications and the law in the American context, contemporary African and African-American cultural transmissions, retentions, expressions, and evolutions, hip hop as a microcosm of black experience. Uh, I have to, include that his classes uh, attract uh, large crowds. Uh, he usually teaches in one of those large classrooms and he does such a great job. His teaching evaluations are exemplary. Uh, Welbeck's forthcoming book is titled, No City for Young Men, Hip Hop and the Narrative of Marginalization. This book may already have come out, so my information may be a little older. He will correct me if necessary. This book explores how hip hop communicates the lived experience of persons who live in urban centers across the nation, particularly black men living in major cities. Uh, I'm happy to introduce Mr. Timothy Welbeck as our panel chair, and we will follow his directions and, and 
this will be the last session of our conference, but of course not the last word is said until he introduces the panelists and starts the conversation. Thank you, Timothy. Thank you for that gracious introduction, Dr. Okor. It's a pleasure to join you and the rest of our colleagues here today for our 19th annual Underground Railroad Conference. It's a pleasure to be able to come before you all today and have our esteemed panel um, share some of their insights and research and the like. And so, Dr. Okor, if I understood you correctly, Dr. Bell is not joining us. I think she muted herself, I'll just wait. Okay, but we, this is okay, but we are joined by Dr. Jeremy Minnis. Dr. Jeremy Minnis is an expert in geographic information systems and science and its application to health and environment. His research focuses on ge geographic information science based modeling of neighborhood, environmental, and social contexts of health behaviors and outcomes. He's currently the associate editor for the CDC journal Preventing Chronic Disease and has served as the president for the University Consortium of Geographic Information science. He's also one of our esteemed colleagues here at Temple University. He teaches in the Department of Ge Geography and Urban Studies. Um, welcome, Dr. Menes. And we are also joined by Ms. Jasmine Clark, who we just heard an insightful lecture from uh, moments ago, speaking about um, uh, animation and other forms of digital research as it relates to our conference topics. And do we have another panelist as well? If, have, I, have I missed someone? Timothy, I'm sorry. No, you didn't. I was going to invite Dr. Woski. Dr. Woski, okay. are you in the group? I think he left. Uh, okay, that's, that, is perfect. that is perfectly fine. Uh, I'd like to begin, if possible, um, with our panelists hearing what Dr. Accord mentioned at the start of the introduction of this panel, if you all could speak about, I guess, the next frontier in terms of making your research accessible to the public and, and other, uh, well, first, I'll start there. Um, what are ways that we can make your research more accessible to the public and help to better augment their understanding as it relates to your areas of expertise? I'm happy to answer. So I'm actually writing a grant now for the project that I'm leading. I didn't talk about it as much because I was focused on underground railroad focus, but um, the virtual Bloxon is a VR game that will recreate the Charles L. Bloxon Afro-American collection space uh, and then have different modules added onto the game over time. It is geared towards teaching high school seniors African-American um, well, primary source literacy. So how to do their own research with the idea being, um, if you're familiar with the, with Charles, with Dr. Bloxon's story, um, when he was a child, he asked his, one of his teachers in elementary school, what Negroes had contributed to history. And she said, nothing, they have no history. Um, and that pushed him into a lifelong history of collecting that built what is now a collection of over 700,000 items from the African diaspora. Um, with that idea being the founding ethos of this project, Students are questioned, are tasked with kind of um, understanding how history is, is constructed, right? You go into an archive, how are these things found? How do they tie to secondary sources? How, how do these become the history that we understand? And what is your role as a Black person in constructing it and enforcing our own history, especially relevant in our, our current political climate, right? What, what that this idea that uh, we have to enforce and, and that we, it is an obligation morally to provide um, Black students with agency um, around creating their own history. And um, I think a huge component of that is one, also there's a lot of archival literature, I'm an archivist by training. So there's a lot of archival literature around why black students don't go into archives as comfortably because the archival profession is about 90% white, 95% white. So you walk into an archive that you were historically banned from until very recently where there are no black people, all the portraits on the walls are white and the way things are organized are all centered around whiteness. And so the idea is to introduce them to a black collection in a black space, but to still give them the understanding of like how you enter an archive, what you're supposed to do and all of that. Um, it is, that's why gamification is so interesting to me because uh, it, it's the idea of how do we take high level research that maybe is kind of 
designed for other scholars. That's, that's, you know, you're writing and publishing for your peers. And how do we make it publicly accessible? How do we make it something that an elementary school can pick up and play as a board game or play as a VR video game or um, that can make it fun for them to conceptually learn and retain that information? So for me, gamification is a major part of that public aspect part. Thank you for those remarks, Ms. Clark. Uh, I think that was very insightful. Um, Dr. Menez, did you want to add to that? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, thanks. Um, yeah, I guess I'll talk a little bit about my, my project, I, you know, which was mostly about um, the eastern shore of Maryland. Um, I mean, what got me really into this project was being in the eastern shore of Maryland and getting down there and being in these places where these incredibly important historic events took place. And, you know, <laughs> it's, it's just like being there and there's like a little sign or something like, you know, the birthplace of Harriet Tubman is here and I'm just standing on the side of a road or this is where, you know, Harriet Tubman helped her parents escape and it's just, you're just in that road. And I was so struck by that and you know, imagining what it might have been like, you know, at that time in that place, um, and it, it's interesting because that area, particularly Dorchester County, the um, you know, it's about the same population as it was in the 1850s. Like there's the, the I looked at the census numbers; it's like 30,000 people in Dorchester County now, and and according to that map that I digitized, they had census information, there was about 20,000 people um, at then. And, and Cambridge, the town is much larger now than it was then. So I think the population of the rural areas may have been even more at that time. And I, I, don't, I don't mean to go off here too much. I, it's just, there's just a great opportunity for developing public history around this area down there because it's so rich. and there is a lot going on right now. Um, I know there's a major initiative from, I think the Maryland Historical Society, you know, they have some funding. And when I was doing some research, just that mural that I was showing, I found, you know, a, an article from um, just a, in the last two weeks that they got a lot of money to develop in the town of Cambridge, um, a number of murals and other sort of um, resources to develop the public history there. How I can contribute to that is a question for me. I don't know, and I'm open to hearing ideas, frankly. I mean, Dr. Clark mentioned story maps and the ability to use some of these kind of visualization and mapping technologies to, to tell a story and narrate. And that's a very you know, popular um, approach right now for integrating kind of geospatial technologies with communicating. Um, popular information, communicating to the public and, and so on. And I think there's a very, it's that narrative approach. I mean, talking about coordinate systems and topologic integrity isn't gonna help me very much in the public history domain. So I, you know, I have to figure out how to do that. And I, I'm hoping to make some connections, but for me, I, you know, when I visualize in my mind what that could look like, it's about an interactive display where people can, you know, interactively visualize like, okay, you're here, you know, and you're escaping from slavery and here are the different risks, like, where would you go now? And they try and click on a screen and, you know, try and, you know, the, the, the displays in museums that I've seen, which I have found very powerful are those that have put a, a visitor into the position of someone else in a way, you know, and um, and so if there's a way to do that using these technologies, I I think that would be, um, you know, really kind of compelling. Yeah. In, indeed, and I, and I think that is a, a a good segue into even. Um, I guess how we can continue this conversation just in how technology is, is changing our ability to be able to document our current reality and the like. Um, Dr. Menes, you are a um, expert in geographical information sciences. And so a lot of that is in your area of expertise. Can you talk about um, this field of study, particularly as it relates to documenting historical processes and even how you go about 
um, being able to bring uh, or bring about the various forms of technology to help capture historical arcs and, and contemporary trends and the like. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the opportunity to talk about that. I mean, that's, you know, GIS is really my, my bread and butter, obviously, not history or African-American history. Um, I, I think there's, there is around digital humanities and spatial history, a real initiative in using geospatial technologies um, for these kinds of projects. Um, I talked about a couple that I'm aware of, um, Cheryl LaRoche's work around um, um, the Underground Railroad and Albert, Alberto Giordano, who is a friend of mine who's done a lot of great work around um, the Holocaust. And there was a big initiative around digitizing the Holocaust maybe 10, 15 years ago. And um, a lot of work came out of that, a book and um, several different projects. And you know, the, the challenge, of course, is about data and representation from historical sources, you know. Um, and, you know, frankly, for most of the work that I do, which is not historical research, but, you know, current, I'm like, give me the data, you know. <laughs> like, I just go download it, you know, and I find it and I try and get it from administrative sources. It's a whole different game when you're, you know, doing this archival research. And, you know, I, I've been online just like, where can I get a map from 1830? I mean, literally, I'm just content, I'm like writing people at the Maryland Historical Society, like, hey, you have a map? Like, I got to drive down to Dorchester County Historical Society and talk to someone. And, you know, what Dr. Okor was saying about like, in all of these places, they have archival materials about narratives of individual people, you know, stored in letters and, and documentation and so on. So, you know, that is really not what I have a lot of experience doing. So, I, you know, one thing that comes to mind is the importance of, you know, collaboration. Um, because people in, in my geospatial science world have these in, in incredible skills with the computational part of it. And I really have so much fun thinking of ways to realize these archival and historical materials in a digital way to, to make them analytically useful. And I, in my brain, I have all these tools. It's like a big, I have like a toolbox and a hammer looking for a cool nail to hit, you know. And a lot of GIS people are like that, you know, they're like, they're tool experts, they're methodological experts. And so, Developing these kinds of collaborations is just, you know, so important. Um, and I, I'll just give like a, a kind of, um, not to toot my own horn, but an advertisement for my organization, University Consortium for Geographic Information Science, which I'm really active in. And, you know, we had a focus on digital humanities a couple of years ago. And I, I just think, gosh, if we could just get these GIS people together with, you know, historians and other folks in the humanities or people interested in these topics, the progress that that we could make is is really exciting. But building those networks of collaboration are challenging. That's why I'm just so so happy to to be able to participate here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Menes. Can I say uh, something? Ab absolutely. Thank you so much. I have one student in the audience, a graduate student, as a matter of fact, a candidate for a PhD. He's writing and finishing his dissertation. Jordan, are you with us? Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to invite Jordan hey, to I'm speak. Here. Hello, Jordan. Hey, what's going on? Uh, <laughs> Hello, Jordan. Hey, it's a pleasure hey. to have you. Good to see you. Uh, Good to see you, Jordan. When Dr. Menis was uh, presenting his uh, research about GIS, I was thinking about you and your research and your dissertation. Mm -hmm. uh, how how wonderful it would have been if we could uh, if we could help you use some of that GIS document and data. And this also connects to what Jasmine was uh, presenting uh, to get the history of the town you are writing 
the narrative of Underground Railroad and uh, freedom seekers in the town. Can you say a few things about uh, that research? Your, uh, the town you are searching about is a primarily African-American town. Mm -hmm. And do you think this GIS data would have used you, would have helped you, or maybe when you write the book after your dissertation, you can still <laughs> use this? All right, the floor is yours, Jordan. Thank you for talking about your work. Oh yeah, no, no problem. Um, me, I'm focusing on African agency uh, in Chester County, Pennsylvania and the surrounding area from uh, 1850 to 1865. And um, yes, uh, uh, Dr. Mesa's uh, research did uh, come in use in terms of what he was saying because some of the places that he mentioned in terms of Maryland uh, comes across some of the areas that I see in terms of looking at African agency. Um, but yeah, no, this is all great research, all great stuff. Um, I like the mapping that he did with the danger areas. Um, I thought that was very unique because I, I, I haven't come across that before where somebody actually tried to go and try to predict where an area would be dangerous and where area would be less dangerous. So I thought that was very unique uh, in his research. Uh, definitely, definitely hundred percent. So no, I think it's all very useful, um, especially for me because um, even though I'm only focusing on 15 years, uh, there's a lot of history um, within Chester County, Pennsylvania, as well as other counties like Lancaster County, Adams County, Cumberland County, uh, so forth and so forth, uh, even going all the way out to Pittsburgh. Um, so yeah, it's, it, this is all great, great stuff, great information um, that I could definitely uh, use uh, <laughs> for, for not only what I'm doing uh, with this dissertation, but also beyond, because I want to continue uh, this research because it's very personal to me because I'm from uh, Chester County, Pennsylvania, originally Oxford, um, right down the street from Lincoln University. Um, so yeah, all this stuff is uh, always interesting because a lot of these places I've heard of or have been past uh, and all that sort of stuff. But uh, but yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate all your presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. You all are doing a great job. Uh, you all are doing tremendous, tremendous work. It's awesome. You too, Jordan, your research is beautiful and very useful. So this means uh, collaboration is so important. We have to reach out uh, to other scholars and create a map, uh, a collaborative map of our research and findings. So we will continue making this uh, research uh, a, better, a better resource place where future scholars can come tap in and benefit from this reservoir, like Jasmine is collecting data. Uh, Jeremy Menes is creating maps for us. Dr. Bell is talking about uh, the metaphor and the importance of the language. Uh, so I'm going to be quiet. I think Dr. Bell is going to be invited by Timothy. Hello, Dr. Bell. Thank you for joining us. So um, for the- Good to be back. Good to be back. Excellent, excellent. And so, Dr. Bell, we've just at, at this juncture been having a conversation, particularly about the the ways that uh, you all's research can become accessible to the public, uh, and ways that some of these tools may be used to help capture some of this important work. Um, Jordan, uh, Mr. Denson just gave some some great examples of how his research is is doing just that. And so uh, that's where our conversation is now, and we would love to have you join us. Um, and particularly, one of the one of the directions I wanted to move our conversation in is the direction uh, Ms. Clark mentioned earlier. She was talking about um, the tools that we have, and sometimes how they can be used in a way that are unintended or have unintended consequences. Particularly, um, when the audience doesn't necessarily understand what is happening and, and the like. I'm particularly thinking about when Ms. Clark mentioned how um, gamification can be a way that we can help the public understand some of these, these um, rigorous concepts and some of the research behind it and make some of the things more access accessible. And one of the things she mentioned was how monopoly is a critique on capitalism. And I would venture to say that the average player of monopoly <laughs> does not I guess, fully appreciate that critique or understand that critique. And I would love, um, if possible, if you all could talk about that, how sometimes people can misinterpret the import 
of these tools or the or the research that they give us access to, or just what happens when the tools are misused, so to speak. Yeah, that's a big topic, isn't it? Uh, and first of all, folks, uh, I added another engagement since 1030. I just logged back in. So I'm flying blind here, having missed the last 90 minutes of this important conference. So my apologies uh, for that. I feel like I'm talking with my arm tied behind my back because I didn't hear a lot of what's been happening uh, this morning. Um, what do I think about that? Yeah, I think the past is a complicated place, right? Uh, we, we all know that. Uh, and yet, when you take history out for a spin, in the public sphere, um, I think subtlety is often one of the first things that um, gets trampled on. Um, actually, that the bandwidth for subtlety is increasingly narrow in our public um, uh, conversations. And so, you know, so for instance, um, the movie Harriet, uh, showcasing Harriet Tubman's extraordinary life and uh, career which came out right before uh, the pandemic. It's one of the last movies I think I saw in theaters back in 2019, um, is I think historically quite problematic in lots of uh, ways. It gets enormous things, important things wrong about uh, Harriet um, Tubman's uh, life. It's, as far as I can tell, it's based on a hagiography from 1869 rather than from, from mo modern scholarship. And that historical advisors like Kate Larson uh, didn't get any sort of script approval um, uh, on it. So we're left with a sort of, you know, uh, mythological mess, uh, though very well acted, by the way, uh, by Cynthia Erivo as Harriet Tubman. Um, and if members of the general public, who are a group, it's very easy to talk about as a homogenous mass of people, right? Oh, we all know the general public. There are lots of different people. But when the general public confront a movie like that, that might be the only time they've engaged with the Underground Railroad since their K-12 educations, um, perhaps. And they can uh, walk away from it, uh, walk away from that piece of uh, Hollywood cinema thinking that they now have a superior and accurate and useful understanding uh, of that. I think, you know, Hamilton the musical functions in broadly similar ways, right? It comes into the, um, uh, into Broadway uh, with the stamp of approval that it's based on Ron Chernow's prize-winning biography of Alexander Hamilton, therefore it must be true and accurate. Uh, yet, of course, as we all know, when it comes to slavery, when it comes to women, when it comes to uh, working class people and the politics of immigration, it gets countless things back to front. Um, and so what we're left with is the sense that the, the public sphere is still a very treacherous place um, to talk about history before a general uh, audience because it's hard to convey nuance uh, and subtlety, uh, especially when confronted by you know heavily monetized commercial vehicles, which um, privilege entertainment, I think, over, over accuracy. So I come back to the classroom, uh, really. I think classrooms are such important spaces because we have a bit more time, we have a bit more freedom, we have a bit more focus to set up DH projects, for instance, um, and say, these are all the complicated things they're trying to do. Now that you're armed with that information, go play around in the sandbox and see what you can learn. And, you know, people who are properly prepped to use DH tools or to see a Broadway musical about the first secretary of the treasury uh, often get more out of it than those who confront these things um, cold. So if I'm winding up to any sort of point here, and I'm not sure that I am, um, it's that classrooms uh, remain incredibly important. And we shouldn't um, assume that um, everything can be fixed by the perfect product aimed at the public um, sphere, because the nature of the public sphere is a, is is a an arena in which subtlety is still not very much valued. Um, I don't think. Whereas, hopefully, classrooms are still places where hard and difficult conversations um, can happen. Thank you for that, Dr. Bell, um, Ms. Clark, or Dr. Minnis. Would, would either of you like to add to that? Yes, actually. So I think that the Monopoly example is a key one because it was developed in what, the 70s. Um, 
And the critiques, when I say there are critiques of Monopoly, a lot of it comes down to like what, how, what, to what extent can gamification, like what role does it serve? How many hours of gameplay, you know, things like that. There's a lot of mechanics that go into games. But one thing that I think I always emphasize and that is emphasized in my project when I talk about the VR, the virtual blocks, and you could ask, you know, why not tell a specific story? And we'll talk about like the first module of it is going to be built around the Pyramid Club and the black and black artists in, here in Philadelphia and slash getting into intersections of colorism and class and all these things and gender that are represented within the, that are particularly within the art scene, right? As black artists. And my double major was art history and African-American studies. So, <laughs> you know, talking about that, but the key part of what the basis of the game is not necessarily the art and it is it is a key part but the basis of it is the methodology behind all of that the basis of the game is how do you research these things how do these materials become history how do these raw research how do primary sources because as um dr bell has pointed out which is very important you have to have the tools to process. <laughs> you have to have context. You have to have method, baseline methods to deal with all of this. Telling a good story is wonderful, but um, how reliable of a narrator are you? And the audience has to have the tools to assess that. And so I think where gamification is really important and where it really shows is because it's a me it's a mechanical process, right? It's teaching your brain the rules of a game. It's teaching you do this and then this, and then under these circumstances, this is allowed and then this isn't allowed. And this is how you're penalized. And this is how you're rewarded. And this is how you win, right? And um, gamification, in my opinion, and what I guess maybe where I lean more towards is suited towards helping people think through that how do you you could build a whole game around like critiquing Hamilton you, you technically could you could you know you get a point every time you identify something that's historically inaccurate you get a point every time you identify you know uh you could go into hip-hop studies and, 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 and create a video game around Hamilton the game the part I mean think about it that's what a drinking game is functionally it's a mechanical process by which you reward people or or penalize people for engaging in certain activities right I mean if children they talk about it. I mean, when you read like literature all the time, the giver, they played war. Why? Because it was supposed to, you know, I guess if you want to get like straight up science and evolutionary biology on us, mammals are conditioned. You simulate hunting, you watch cats and that's what they're doing. They're like, oh, look, my cat loves me. It's wiggling its butt. It's like, yeah, it's simulating murdering you. That's, <laughs> you know, that's what, that's what the gameplay is, right? And so to me, when we talk about gamification, to make it less abstract for people, I say it's it's about how well you communicate those mechanics and whether your mechanics actually accurately capture the process. So with Monopoly, what you taught people how to do was be better capitalists, right? I start, I mean, I when I was like character uh, study into my personality, when I was in like middle school, I started just give, dishing out high interest loans to my, to the other players because I wanted the game to end. So I just learned that I could just win, that you become the best capitalist by exploiting your fellow players. That will fly straight over your head. So I'm like, they succeeded in one way, right? <laughs> they maybe missed the critique part. <laughs> so um, I do, I do think that when we talk about you know, the ability to use these tools for evil. Um, thank goodness I didn't become a high interest capitalist, you know, like predatory lender. Um, but uh, when we talk about the ability to use these, these things um, incorrectly, I do think that there needs to be more attention paid to the methodology component of everything, right? We, I think sometimes when you're a scholar, you skip to the like, well, obviously, like I said, you produce your research for your peers, but there has it's, it can be a long time since you've been in a classroom and had to really think about like what does someone with no grounding in what I'm talking about, how do I get them to even be able to critique? Like what's the we're missing something between point A and point C, you know? Like where where is that? So maybe that's like my area where I'm very interested, why I think about ethics and things and like me, your media studies gets into that, right? Like to some degree, the critical era, but um. I don't know, but we can end it there. I don't think I'll have a termination of the sentence. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. that. That was very insightful. And, and it was great even how you were contextualizing just how often we're engaging in these practices and don't even realize it. even down to, like you said, a drinking game is still a game and it's something that it incorporates many of these fundamental elements. I think that was, I think that was excellent. Um, Dr. Akor has her hand raised. Did you have a question or comment, Dr. Akor? Uh -huh. 
Yes, thank you, Timothy. It is really not a question, but uh, probably a thank you to all of you, uh, not to end the conversation, but I'm very impressed. Uh, a quick question to Jasmine. Jasmine, uh, you spoke about the Duckworth Scholars Studio. Uh, how will this studio help and advance underground railroad and black history uh, projects? Can you briefly give us uh, some information because it's uh, very exciting uh, that you are heading this scholar studio. And of course there, is, uh, there are funds related with this. I think people have to apply its uh, fellowship if I'm correct. Uh, just tell us uh, how we can benefit, you know, uh, and then a question to uh, Mr. Welbeck about your anti-racism center. Uh, what do you envision as the incoming chair? It's going to be the first uh, in uh, Temple's history uh, and probably in the region. How will your center uh, under your directorship advance our research in black history and underground railroads? So as you can see, I am very, very uh, straightforwardly asking your uh, help in future about our research. And this of course is very important for Dr. Menes, for Dr. Bell, myself, Dr. Dove, who always uh, thinks about educating students first and foremost. And of course, uh, Mr. Welbeck being an attorney. Uh, it's a very inclusive question, but if we can hear from Jasmine uh, what she has in mind, then maybe Timothy, you can talk about your uh, your vision. Thank you. So as I said, um, and actually I shared a link to everyone to the Underground Railroad in Southern Illinois project. They actually have multiple things for Southern Illinois, but um, as I kind of said in my presentation, a lot of these spaces are basically labs um, and as with anything comes down to the quality of your staff, not to, you know, hug myself up, but um, it is to say that um, what these kinds of projects, like the one I showed you are the kinds of things that these spaces typically produce. We are a library, we're inherently um, interdisciplinary space. We're not, we don't belong to a singular school. Ideally what these centers function to do is create a space where different scholars can connect. This comes down to the quality of staff part where how well networked are your librarians? How much do they know each other? And are they able to kind of point out to say like, this person's doing research in line with your own. Um, and also our technical staff. So the reason we have a hard gaming lean, I'm, I'm not the head of the space, my boss is, but we basically co run everything because it's a small staff. The, but our head of tech and he both do game studies. So gamification is something I get into a lot. We play a lot of games. We do a lot of stuff like that. Um, but we do others, other stuff. We obviously host GIS and Omeka and like ArcGIS, um, things like that. So my point being, if you're one, we serve the purpose of creating this shared disciplinary space where you can meet other scholars who are doing work that complement your own. These kinds of projects like the one at Southern Illinois are multifaceted. There's 3D um, scans of artifacts from related to the Underground Railroad. There are maps, there's GIS data, there is place-based education resources. There's a whole bunch of stuff that goes on. And as Dr. Menes pointed out, you can't do that by yourself. You have to have collaborators. Um, in addition, yes, there's grant funding for um, so for example, with the Makerspace grant, um, we had an art, uh, one of our former staff was an art historian and focused on Norse history and 3D printed. You can do um, filaments. So if you don't know how additive 3D printing is, additive meaning you build it up as opposed to carving away. Uh, additive 3D printing, you run a filament, which is usually made of some sort of polymer, like a plastic, um, through a superheated nozzle that then deposits it and builds it up into a full object. Um, those filaments can include wood, metal, different things integrated into the plastics. And so what she did was she 3D printed a metal, using a metal based filament, um, an axe head, and then you can actually stain it. So she made it look rusted and she recreated this thing from a museum and had students then able to actually handle it. So part of a makerspace grant would be doing things like that. We have faculty using MadMapper to create 3D projections on their walls. 
Um, and so we offer, you can write a grant and a proposal. You can, and you can talk to me or I can redirect you to whoever would be best to talk to you about how to write that, what goes into that. And then we offer funding for you to use our resources. Um, also, I do work, I do do integrated instruction. So uh, Dr. Neumeyer here at Temple University is an art history professor. She does Islamic architecture uh, from going into Turkey all the way over into like you into, where's her regions? Up into the Middle East. And um, I teach a SketchUp class. I helped her design her course that um, SketchUp is a 3D modeling, you, you create buildings. So um, I helped her design her assignments in her course and her students come into the workshop, into, the, the, into our space. I teach them this, how to use the software and help them with their projects. And then they're graded on it. And it gives them like a conceptual, you can walk, they can walk into the 3D models. So they go into our, they then use our VR space, put on headsets and go into the space, the buildings they created. Um, and that helps them have a better understanding of what Islamic architecture, how these spaces are constructed, what they look like, the garden designs, tile, whatever they want to focus on. Um, and I do stuff like that. So if you're like, oh, how do I integrate this into my coursework? You can come talk to me. We'll figure it out. <laughs> so very lab free kind of space. So if you're ever like stuck and you're like, I don't know how to find something or I don't know what talk, what, how to integrate this into my teaching or I don't know whatever, we're here to consult with you. So that's the value of our space. In terms of black, I'm, I'm, I'm black. And I make sure we do black stuff all the time in our space. I mean, I'm it. <laughs> um, we have Sinatra who's here um, as a postdoc, but um, one of my mission when I came to it is everybody who worked with me as a white man, uh, I was like, we're gonna be doing a lot of black DH. The virtual blocks and is my baby and I've dragged them all into it with me and they're, <laughs> they're, they're willingly now. But <laughs> so um, I do a lot of, I do a lot of focus on Black DH specifically. So if you have like Black DH questions, I'm very, I'm pretty adept. I think I can help you, so. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Welbeck. Yes, thank you, Dr. Okor. So in terms of how my vision connects to efforts like the Underground Railroad Conference, one of the chief visions for the Center for Anti-Racism Research is fortifying the public's understanding of not only the work of anti-racism, but how the work of anti-racism connects to the broader thread of the quest for liberation from some of the systems and structures in the United States that disenfranchise people based on some of these arbitrary classifications. As it relates to that, Dr. Asante and Dr. Dove wrote a great book, Being Human Being, that talks about this very notion about the historical arc of how we have created these arbitrary classifications that have no biological merit, but they have very real and tangible impacts on everyday society. And so as it relates to the center, one of the ways that we seek to go about doing that is doing direct scholarship, independent scholarship that will help to shape the discourse and to move above some of the, the paradigm, as Dr. Asante says, to move above the race paradigm, so to speak, and, and incorporating some of the ideas that are mentioned in Dr. Asante and Dr. Dove's book. And after we're authoring some of those things, we want to make the things that we create, the scholarship that is accessible to the public. And so the way I envision our scholarship working is we will do, um, we will do scholarship like books and, and journal articles and things like that, but then we want to distill that down into things that the public can access. And so we'll do TED Talk style lectures and social media campaigns and instructional videos, op-eds and major national publications so that everyday people can en engage in these materials too, because oftentimes the scholarship that is in peer-reviewed journals and sometimes even in books are not as widely read by everyday people. Oftentimes it's just academics reading and talking to each other as it relates to that, that, that style of scholarship. And so I envision creating the type of scholarship that can help shape the direction of what we do as peers talking to each other, but then also helping the public understand what we're doing as it relates to that. And then lastly, what I think to be one of our more important pieces of work is I want to have tangible impact in the community and that I want to partner with um, organizations and, and clinics and, and other um, leaders within North Philadelphia 
to help meet the needs of our neighbors in North Philadelphia. I want Temple to be a better neighbor to um, the community that houses it. And so there are ways that we can go about doing that. There are people who are already doing some of that work. We want to partner with them in doing that. And so um, that's, that is my vision as it relates to that. I look at the scholarship happening in, in those three tiers, traditional scholarship, um, that's that's um, something that you would expect from a tier, I mean, R1 um, institution. So like, um, we'll do studies and, and journal articles and things like that, partner with people doing studies and help amplify that research, um, do public um, uh, public facing work to help um, the public understand what we're talking about. And sometimes that will even entail events and things like that as well that we'll make available to the public. And then lastly, uh, and I think most importantly, doing direct service initiatives um, within within the neighborhood of North Philadelphia and in hopes of that even serving as a model that other centers across the country could do as well. And, 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 and also as we're doing that work, I think it will make us better advocates too. So as we are advocating for um, different systems and different approaches and different strategies, we'll have, I would say, more informed and better informed ways about doing that because we would have worked with the people who are directly impacted by what we're talking about. So uh, that's what I envision. That's the work that we have in front of us. Um, there are many people across campus that I, I would like to work with and we and to some degree have begun having conversations about that, others that we will as the time permits. But that's what we're working towards in, in terms of the center having a multifaceted, multi-tiered approach to doing the work. Um, thank you very much for this, uh, Timothy. I appreciate um, representing the department and we are approaching to the very end. This is why representing the department, we have Dr. Dove. Uh, Dr. Dove, thank you for attending. <clears throat> Would you like to add anything? Uh, I know you always wish us well, but uh, can you can you add anything? Would you like to add anything? It may be about your new book. Um, well, really, Timothy has touched upon that with that I co-wrote with Dr. Asante, where we're just looking at the construction of of race, the cultural construction of race, and you know, defining how it impacts us. Timothy says but it's actually a construction that we're all made to believe in and make judgments about each other based on all these hierarchies which divide us. And uh, so becoming, you know, to becoming, becoming in the knowledge of what it is to be human, we just use the ancient African principles of what that is and recognize that we have more things in common as human beings than we do in all these constructions, uh, race being one of them, patriarchy being another one, so, and how they interact with each other. So that's sort of the nature of the book, but it's very accessible to an ordinary person. When I say ordinary, everybody is extraordinary, but I mean um, people who are not in the sort of ivory tower of uh, thinkers and who are, you know, gaining credibility and and wealth of some kind from these ideas, which oftentimes don't relate to um, people. So the the uh, the center will be absolutely wonderful to cater to the needs of people, and we we'll feel very strongly, as you know in the department that that is the missing link in a way. And uh, to make this connection will enable us to work with the real issues that people are having to deal with. So there would be sort of round table discussions that would be inclusive of people in the community. It might be about issues about women, in, um, African women, black women in, in clinics, hospital treatment, um, various things um, relating to the issues that people have to deal with every day. We would have those types of conferences and meetings, uh, as well as all the data that we're going to collect. So 
uh, we're very excited, as you know, Neil Gunn, uh, Dr. Akur, it's, it's a, a wonderful, you know, I mean, George Floyd died for this, many, many people before George Floyd and since George Floyd, but that was a, a telling moment for the department because that is what we focus on anyway. Um, and uh, so it was an opportunity to be able to reach out and make more people aware of the constructions and the, uh, you know, agency reduction um, forces that are in play. That's it. I hope that made sense in all of this. I thank you very much for the allowing me and the Underground Railroad and the connection. I knew nothing about all these technological things. I've learned so much. I, I can't believe it. It's kind of another world. I feel like I'm, you know, I've got to sort of get in touch with it or otherwise I'll just be left in this world and I don't know whether that's the greatest place on earth to be at the moment so it's all interesting for me thank you very much everybody of course it's all coming together we didn't know what we were going to do with this material I was a reader of William Still's uh, book 1852 uh, the Underground Railroad, and I was looking at maps, and I was traveling myself. But now, a deed that comes from 1823, or a French house that was established by a Quaker, or William Still's house on, North, on South Street, and the marker in front of Lucretia Mott's uh, property on 611 now make more sense to me, because uh, both Jeremy and both Rick explained this morning that we can now do wonders with this material in our hands. And all this will be stored digitally. So we need Jasmine, we need uh, Timothy to store the data and make it accessible to the public. Because as I understand, the center that's also being established is going to be the collaborative uh, effort and explain what our duties are as teachers who are teaching humanities. So for College of Liberal Arts to house this anti-racism center is very important. And we will of course draw uh, interests and expertise of all faculty uh, at uh, Temple and primarily College of Liberal Arts. So spearheading this movement, uh, of course, our department is important. So by contributing to our conference, I appreciate your efforts preparing excellent presentations, diligent work, Jeremy and uh, Rick, I appreciate all your efforts. Jasmine, I appreciate all the links you have sent us. Would you please share all those links in a summary format with me and our speakers? and um, anyone who's interested in the group. Uh, there, is a, there is a note we can, oh, our wonderful manager, Miss Wilson is saying, this is her chat, that we are thanking to Dr. Ade and all of today's presenters. You can view this seminar and others on our YouTube channel, Africology Temple University. For more information on future seminars, please subscribe to our channel. So having read this note from our manager, Ms. Wilson, I also uh, understand it is time for us to end. If there are no remarks, no questions from the audience, I want to thank uh, Timothy Welbeck, uh, Jasmine Clark, uh, Dr. Jeremy Menes, and Dr. Richard Bell, and Jasmine, I don't see you, but I know you are there. So have a beautiful day once again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It was one of the best conferences that I have been in, and I'm very proud and honored to have met you through Zoom. Hopefully this conversation will continue and we will do better researches uh, for our students and our community. Have a beautiful day. We are ending our 19th conference. We will meet next year, the 20th conference, uh, hopefully in February and face to face. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was.
Very nice. Thank, Thank you all. Very good. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> Thank you, my students.